Hey, you're live. You're good, Chris. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Christopher Coretta. I'll be chairing this evening's meeting. I'm an associate real estate broker living in the historic Grove Place Preservation District. I also sit on the executive committee for the Landmark Society of Western New York, as well as serve as a trustee on their board. We're meeting tonight under, under extraordinary circumstances due to state and local emergency orders requiring social distancing. We amended the Rochester Preservation Board bylaws to allow us to conduct this hearing as authorized by the governor's and mayor's emergency board and to waive other requirements in order to proceed this online hearing. These waivers permit us to hold this hearing by teleconference with no in-person attendance, allow applicant presentations by teleconference and require all public comments, both in favor of and opposed to the application to be submitted in writing by, by mail, email, or hard copy document mailed to the zoning office or deposited in the secure Dropbox location in the link entrance to City Hall. All written public comments were all required to be submitted by 5 p.m. yesterday. Although this hearing has been altered for some of our normal procedures, many things remain the same. <clears throat> Excuse me. All the normal, normal notifications for this hearing, including mailed notice, publication, and the posting of notice were followed. All the normal timeframes for applicant presentations and comments in favor of and opposed to the application remain the same. And most importantly, this board will hear, review, and make decisions about all the applications with the same diligence and using the same standards as required by the zoning code. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that when a case is called, the applicant will be allowed 15 minutes to present. The applications are posted on the city website and available for the public to review. All applicants were advised to ensure that their applications were complete and included all information that they intend to, excuse me, intend to present at this hearing tonight. As the application is presented, staff will, as reasonably as, as possible, show the pages of the application the applicant is addressing. Following our normal procedure, the board members may ask the applicant questions. If during the hearing, the board determines that substantial new evidence has been submitted by the applicant during the presentation or is given in response to questions by the board, the case will be adjourned to the next announced hearing date to allow the public to review the new evidence and to submit additional comments. After the applicant's presentation is completed, staff will read into the record any comments received after the comment deadline that are not already posted on the city website. There will be no call in comments. After all the comments have been read, the applicant will have five minutes to offer any testimony and rebuttal. The board will commence deliberations and voting after the public hearing of each agenda item, with the exception of any applications that are being adjourned. Please also note that if your case is approved today, a written decision will be mailed to you within 15 business days. The decision will inform you of the next steps to be complete, to, to complete the approval process. Before we open the first case, Please note that we're all volunteers on this board. I'd like each of the members to confirm, confirm their presence for purposes of establishing a quorum for this hearing and to introduce themselves and please mention their area of expertise. We'll start with Deborah Beardsley, please. Hi everyone, my name is Deborah Beardsley. I am a designer and a design professor at RIT in the college. Thanks Deborah. Uh, Kijana Crawford. Kijana Crawford, I'm a professor of sociology, anthropology at Rochester Institute of Technology, and I live in the Susan B. Anthony Preservation District. Thanks, Kijana. Jim Devinney. My name is Jim Devinney, and I live in the Cornhill Historic uh, District, where I serve as the neighborhood historian. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Gerald Gam. Uh, good evening, everybody. Gerald Gam. I'm a professor of political science. Science and History at the University of Rochester. And uh, with Chris Kretter, I sit as a trustee of the Landmark Society and I'm a resident of the East Avenue Preservation District. Thank you, Gerald. David Matthews. Hi, my name is David Matthews. I'm an architect and I live in the Highland Park neighborhood. Thanks, David. And Kirsten Solberg, our co-chair. Hello, I'm Kirsten Solberg and I am also an architect and I live in the Browncroft neighborhood. Staff? I will start with I'm Tom. I'm Chris Worth. Snyder. I'm Chris Snyder and I'm with the City of Rochester Zoning Office. Um, I am also staffed to the Rochester Preservation Board. 
My name is Tom Worth. I'm a lawyer with the legal department of the city of Rochester and counsel to the board. Okay, thank you board members and staff. Mr. Snyder, are you ready to call the first case? Yes, I am. The first case uh, is case one for file number A-022-20-21 for a landmark designation of 75 Hoyt Place. The applicant is Arlene Wright with Historic Brighton. Um, and the purpose is to nominate for landmark status, the structures and grounds of Brighton Cemetery, I'm which okay. is located within the city of Rochester. Um, this is, uh, all board members present have visited this site. Great. Very good, thank you. Arlene Wright, are you with us? I am, uh, you can hear me. Uh, can. For the record, my legal name is Arlene Vanderlind, okay. uh, but Arlene Wright, I answer to as well. Great, Arlene, will you be the only one uh, presenting tonight? Uh, present also is Mary Jo Lanfear, who is the Brighton Town historian, and um, um, Marilyn, uh, Volpe, who is uh, the president of the uh, Brighton Cemetery Association. Okay, I just have to swear all of you in. So we will start with Arlene Vanderlyn. Um, do you follow me from the testimony you're about to give in this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I, I do. Thank you. And Mary Jo Lanfear, do you follow me from the testimony you're about to give is here, in this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Mary Jo, you might be I muted. do. Okay, great, thank you. And Marilyn Volpe, do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this hearing is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Marilyn, are you with us or just muted? I don't think she's with us. Okay, okay. then we are ready for your presentation. Thank you very much. This site, uh, I became familiar with this site actually in the mid 80s when the Built Environment Awareness Program, which was an educational program administered by the Landmark Society, uh, was uh, bringing historic preservation uh, to fourth graders in the city school district. And at, um, at school one, I was presenting the program at school one and part of it was a mystery tour. And uh, because it was located near the old Brighton Village at East Avenue and Winton Road, uh, and the cemetery was located there, we actually toured that site. The children were given a list of the symbols that they would find within the cemetery, and uh, they learned about the history of the people that were buried there and what they meant to the history of the community, not only the town of Brighton, but Rochester, of course. And um, so this uh, became a very important uh, part of, of my life uh, as well. Uh, the cemetery was originally, as I said, located within the town of Brighton, but was annexed um, by the city of Rochester in 1905 as it was growing and expanding. And uh, there the uh, uh, village had the Brighton uh, Town Hall, its post office, the Brighton Cem uh, Cemetery and the Brighton Presbyterian Church uh, there. And um, so at that particular point in time, uh, it did become part of, of Rochester and um, during the years that followed, at times it was forgotten completely. While even it was an active cemetery, but uh, the Cemetery Association was founded in 1892 and they govern and take care of the cemetery itself. But at various points in its history, it was considered to be abandoned. Um, so uh, I just thought that this, the time had come for the city of Rochester to recognize this historic site and the value to the history of the community, not only Brighton's history, but the history of Rochester, which because they are so closely entwined. Uh, so that that is the reason why we bring this forward. Okay, great. Uh, it's an amazing site. Thank you for your presentation. We'll do a round robin of uh, board members for any questions that they may have. 
we'll go alphabetically. We'll start with Deborah Beardsley. Deborah, do you have any questions for the applicant? Hi there, I do not. I think it's a great application. Great, thank, thank you. you. Um, I'm next. I don't have any questions. I think it's a great application as well. Kijana, any questions for the applicant? I have no questions and it's, it's a very good uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jim Devini, questions for the applicant, please. Jim, are you with us? Sorry, I was. Uh, no, I have uh, no questions, but uh, I just wanted to say I'm very enthusiastic about this proposal. Thank you. Gerald Gam, any questions, please? Um, I also have no questions. This was a great proposal, and my only question is one to myself. How did I not know the cemetery existed until <laughs> this week? Hey, thank you. David Matthews. Yes, yeah, similar to, to Gerald, I have no questions. I enjoyed uh, learning more about the, the extensive history of the, the grounds and uh, cemetery, and um, it, it was great uh, learning experience for me. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, David. And Kirsten, any questions? I'm going to echo everything that everyone has said. No questions. Okay, great. Thank you, members. Um, staff, any public testimony that we would read into the record? Yes, we do. Uh, there is one um, item of public testimony um, for the public and everyone who is here with us today. Uh, all public comments needed to be submitted to our office by 5 p.m. Uh, yesterday, December 1st, to be included into the public record. There is one comment here uh, from Donna Gillespie. Um, Donna states, I nominate for landmark status the structures and grounds of Brighton Cemetery located in the city of Rochester. I live a block away and frequently walk with my dog through and read the gravestones. It's peaceful to walk through, although it is adjacent to the 490 Expressway. Living in the city, it's nice to find these quiet places. I do hope it will be better taken care of. However, it seems to hold so much history. Thank you, Donna Gillespie. One can at Cathaway Park, Rochester, New York. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, and Arlene, uh, you have the right to rebut or say anything uh, about the comment that was made. You don't have to, but you have the right to if you'd like. I, I really, can you hear me? Am I, I can muted? hear you. Okay. Um, I really appreciate all the positive comments. I thank you very, very much for that. Um, I have one comment, I think. Um, if you went through there at the beginning of Hoyt Place, there is a sign. And I would love to see that sign change to no outlet rather than dead end. Um, if you can catch the kind of uh, raw humor in that, I guess it happens. I was talking to Mary Jo Lamphier today, and she said there are several cemeteries that are at the end of of um, of public streets and they have the dead end sign but uh, uh, I, I would love to see that change <laughs> for the for the uh, dignity of this wonderful place so so Arlene I can kind of address that um, traffic control <laughs> signs are regulated by uh, the county um, if you want to, after this hearing, and we can discuss that as an aside outside of this project. Okay. Um, but that's definitely something I can direct you to uh, at sometime later this week. It would be very helpful. I thank you very much. I'm glad you, you see the uh, importance of this site uh, to the community. And uh, I think a lot can be learned from this. And uh, I, I'm very excited about this. And I thank you for your positive uh, feedback. Thank you, Arlene. Um, Chris Snyder, deliberations page. Ready for that? We want me to yes. go over the comments and deliberations. Yep. So we are ready for uh, deliberations on this um, application. Uh, when the board goes into deliberations, uh, they will review the cases and take action by voting. Uh, there's no participation by the public or the applicants uh, during deliberations. Thank you. Um, we'll start again alphabetically. Actually, we'll, I'll start reverse uh, alphabetically. We'll start with Kirsten. Um, your thoughts, comments on this, Kirsten? Um, so my thoughts are, first, what struck me was really, 
if you want to go through the standards of what constitutes a landmark, it's really kind of a testament to what used to be here and around this site. You can imagine where the canal once was and now the highway's there. And it's so incredible just to think about you have this moment that's locked in time. And that just really struck me. And I didn't even know the history of Brighton Village being right within this area. But if you continue to go through the standards, identification with a historic person or event, I think it checks off that box. It's in, very interesting to walk through and see all the names that are associated with roads that we drive around and you know what the actual meaning for these people are in the community. Um, a distinctive area of the city. Of, sorry? Oh. Um, and then uh, presence of potential information important to history or prehistory in a distinctive area of the city. I think it checks all of those boxes. So I, I would be supportive of this designation. Great, thank you. David Matthews, your thoughts, please. Yeah, I would agree. I think, uh, you know, it goes back to some of the earliest uh, times for Rochester's history. So like what what would be more worthy than uh, than something like this? So I'm in, in agreement and uh, uh, Kirsten did a nice job with the with the criteria. So um, I have nothing else to add from that. Thank you, David. Uh, Gerald, your thoughts? Yeah, I'm entirely on board with this designation. I think Kirsten and Dave have summarized the case well as we look at the criteria used for designating something a sitting landmark, as Kirsten points out, this hits many of the different uh, criteria. And I think this is a really exciting moment because it will, assuming uh, the board votes to approve this, this will help call attention to a site of real importance for upstate New York, for the city and for Brighton. Great, thanks Gerald. Uh, Jim Devinney, your thoughts please. Uh, no, I um, I love this little cemetery. It's almost like a little pocket cemetery that's kind of hidden away, but stands on a very important uh, piece of ground. And I, I just feel the romance of those early days. Every time I go into that, that cemetery and look around me and think what might have been or what was. So I'm, as I said before, I'm very enthusiastic about this proposal. Thank you. Kajano? Oh, I am very excited about this proposal uh, and so glad that um, uh, the, the committee has brought this to our attention. Um, it's just another jewel in the community and in Brighton. So I'm, I, I'm very much in favor. Thank you, Kajana. I would be next. I agree with all my colleagues. I'm very much in favor of this project. And I thank you very much for bringing it to us. Um, and last but certainly not least, Deborah Beersley, what are your thoughts, please? Hard to go last on this one without repeating a lot of things. So I'll just say that I endorse everything my fellow board members have said and the review standards, the way that this project satisfies our review standards is pretty unique and, and really important. So I think it's a high quality application and I support it. Great, thank you. Deborah, would you like to give me a motion? Sure. Um, I'd like so to I, make the I want to interrupt just really quick um, for the new board members and also I guess for everyone just as a reminder we're making a recommendation for approval to the preservation or to the the city planning commission because the city planning commission is the one that actually makes the final approval so when you're making your motion it would be to recommend I, approval of yes I, I don't know if that's the case I think uh, both boards uh, have to approve it so the code says that the, the preservation board makes a recommendation for approval. Um, we may not have done that in the past. It, I guess it's sort of semantics at that point, but. But we would not, we it. would, Chris, we would nominate it in our, in our motion, I would think, right? Yeah, it would be a nomination because the board is making a recommendation for the, the nomination of it. <laughs> okay. I would just look at the request on the um, staff notes to nominate for landmark status of structure. Okay. Should I start? Uh, yeah, I would, I would suggest. Okay. That. Okay. So for case yeah. number one, 
Sorry, I'm getting a bit of a delay. Should I start now? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, for case number one, file number A022021, um, and then there are in parentheses L001. 2021 at 75 Hoyt Place. I would like to recommend that we nominate for landmark status the structures and grounds of Brighton Cemetery, which is located within the city of Rochester. Second. Second. Um, so Deborah Beardsley made the motion. I think Kajana Crawford seconded it. And I will say that a motion has been made and properly seconded. I'll go down, starting with Deborah for the vote. Um, Deborah, do you vote yay or nay for this motion? I vote yay. Thank you. I'll be next. Christopher Coretta, I vote yay for this motion. Kajana Crawford? Vote yay. Kajana Crawford votes yay for this motion. Jim Devinney? Yay. Jim Devinney is a yay for this motion. Gerald Gamp? I vote yay. Gerald votes yay. Gerald Gams yay for this motion. David Matthews? I vote yay. David Matthews votes yay for the motion. And Kirsten Solberg? Yay. Kirsten Solberg is a yay. That's unanimous. Thank you very much. OK. So we will move to case two on the agenda tonight. Uh, Thank case... you all very, very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we will move to case two on the agenda tonight. Case two is 476 Beach Avenue. This is an application for a certificate of appropriateness. The file number is A-023-20-21 and the applicant is Hollis Creek, who is the property owner. The purpose of this application is to install a 12 foot by 24 foot in-ground gunite concrete pool in the side yard of this single family home, an action also requiring an area variance and to install approximately 105 linear feet of four foot tall decorative wrought iron fencing in the front yard and side yard of the property. Uh, everyone has visited the site. All all board members have visited the site. Yes, thank you, Chris. We'll get, that, we'll get that into record. Okay, Hollis Creek, are you with us? So is Hollis with us? I'm is... here. Wait, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay, sorry about that. It was muted. Okay. Sorry. I have to swear. I have to swear you in. Uh, Hollis okay. Creek. You... You solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. Okay, great. So we're ready for your application, your presentation. Um, okay, I'm looking to put in a what I call a garden pool, which will be small in scale. It will be 12 feet by 24 feet and fit nicely in between the existing landscaping. It will be a gunite pool with deep, rich interior color and will be trimmed with a tile border. The pool will be put in by design pool and spa. The top coping will be a natural neutral stone. Um, and I've included samples for your review. This will not be your typical plastic liner pool with silver ladders, diving board and white plastic steps. My goal is to have the pool be high in quality with natural materials so it blends with its surroundings, so not to compete with the beauty of the setting. Because my home is on the water, it has essentially two front yards, one facing the road and one facing the water. It has no backyard. I propose to tuck it in behind the side load garage and the side yard it will be part of the landscape set in between the existing gardens. The entire property has existing black, black iron fencing, and we will add two short black iron fences, both with double gates to accommodate lawnmowers, et cetera, and to close off the side and front yard. Please refer to the survey map and example of the fencing. 
it will be very similar and plain to what is existing there now. My home is a Claude Bragdon jewel, and that's exactly how I treat it. It is impeccable on the inside and outside, and I take great pride in keeping it beautiful. I have included examples of other Claude Bragdon homes and other architecturally significant homes that are in the preservation district in Rochester, all with swimming pools. I have also included historic homes on Beach Avenue on the waterfront that also have in-ground pools. They are my neighbors. Most importantly, I've provided written letters from, and with comments from my direct neighbors to the east, west, and directly across the street. All are very much in favor of this project and I've included all emails and letters that they have shared. Um, I'm sure you have questions about the pool. I know there was uh, a negative uh, letter that was sent and, and I want to address that too at the appropriate time. Okay, thanks for the presentation. It's a, I think it's a very well done presentation. Um, personally, I've seen your work, you do amazing work. Um, so what we're gonna do is open it up to the members now, board members for questions. We'll start with Deborah Beardsley. Deborah, do you have any questions for the applicant? Chris, I don't have any questions at this time. I had quite a few tech issues in our pre-meeting, so I'd, I'd like to hear what other members have to say, and perhaps I'll have uh, a question at the end. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I'm next. Uh, I don't have any questions. I think it was a, a well done presentation, very well detailed. Um, Kajana, any questions for the applicant? No, I have no questions. I'm just excited about uh, this um, a pool, garden pool, as you are. It's quite interesting. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kajana. Jim Davini, any questions, please? No, I have no questions. I have to admit, when I saw the house, I was kind of bowled over by it. It's a beautiful house and um, beautiful grounds. It is. Okay, Gerald Gam, questions? Um, I do have a question. I like the proposal very much. And the information you're providing us about the pool all makes sense to me. The, the location of the pool, the materials you're using for the pool, the fact there's gonna be no deck. My question is actually about the fence. So your property already has a beautiful wrought iron fence uh, at various points, uh, certainly near the driveway that I think, and I can visualize it completely, I think will connect with the new fence and the new gate. Um, but the existing fence has quite a different design. The individual sticks, I am not trained at this. What do we call them? Styles or something? The individual posts that make up the Spears. fence. We'll call them spears. And actually that's a good way to describe them because if you think of the existing fence and I'm looking at my phone, um, the spears are all open at the top. They just shoot up and there's nothing at the top except these straight up and down spears. And then maybe a third of the way down, there are two horizontals. And then in the middle of the horizontals are these beautiful circles. So the existing fence is a black wrought iron fence with a very distinctive design with openness at the top and these circles um, with two horizontals. The fence that's being proposed is not open at the top. It has two tightly spaced horizontals at the top and no design coming down. So except for the fact that they're both black and they're both wrought iron, they seem like very different designs. So my initial question, I may have follow-ups, is would it be possible for you to replicate the existing design? Okay, can I answer that or is it not my turn? Sure. No, please. Oh, no, no, this is a question okay. for you. Directly to you. All right, so this is what you have to take into consideration. This is really important. So the fence that you're looking at with the circles is almost 70 inches high. It's like 66 inches high. So if to do all of that, have the tall separate, I, my goal was to have really the fence disappear. It's going to be considerably shorter. 
than what is going around the front of the house by the road and the side of the house and the back, the front of the house by the water. It's huge. It's probably almost as tall as I am down by the water. So if we had all that going on, it would be way too busy and it would look squatty. So my feeling is if we keep it simple and it's a small area, it's not a large area, it's basically going to disappear. The area on the right side of the house where the pool will be is basically covered by the garage almost and by my husband's big truck that is always in that spot. I mean, meaning like that it that gate will hardly be visible. The other fence will be considerably closer to the water because it it connects to where the side right after where the side entry is on the west side of the property. So I feel rather than having a fence that's squatty with circles going around that busy is not what I think that house needs. Okay. So Ms. Creek, because I look at the property plan that we have in front of us on our screens, mm -hmm. the existing fence, the one that I'm describing that has the circles that has the spears coming up at the top that are open. Mm -hmm. If I'm remembering correctly, does that run along the left property line where it says 170? Yes. It's oh. all along the front of the house by Beach Avenue, the side on the west side that you just had your pointer going to, all along that, down to the water, over across the whole frontage of the water, and back up. Right. So I'm, I'm correct. There, the existing the, fence... But, the, the existing yep. fence runs from Beach Avenue along that line that says 170 down to the water. Yes, sir. The existing fence, the one that yes. you're saying is very tall and yeah. very elaborate. And well, so that, it's taller. Yes, it is tall. Okay, so I'm just expressing my concern, and, and this is just my job sitting on the preservation board, that to have two wrought iron fences especially ones that are immediately adjacent to each other because you have this one fence that is the historic fence that's running the length of the property from the street to the beach. And then you're gonna have this other fence at a right angle attached to it, having them at separate heights and very different designs. My initial reaction, I wanna hear what others on the board think, my initial reaction is that that would not be appropriate. And that in fact, it would call a lot of attention to this other fence. What, I would recommend is simply using the existing fence design and fence height and making that the horizontal. And I think then the new piece of the fence would fade away because you're already seeing that exact fence. So okay. my question yep. at this point is just a simple one, which is, would that be possible if, if on the board others were to agree and we otherwise were approving the proposal, is it technically possible for you to match the existing fence? Can I answer that or is that for the board now? Oh, no, no. That's a technical question for you. Okay. Honestly, I don't want a, a 66 inch fence going across the front of my property. That I don't want. I want it to be shorter. And what the code says, which is, I think it's four feet, okay. right? I'm just asking a simple question, which is, and, and I appreciate what you're saying, do you know, is it technically possible to match the existing fence? The fence is old. I don't, you know, the fence has been there for decades. Okay. It's in good working okay, order. Thank you. So that, that was honestly my only question and we'll get to talk I, I about the fence that, later, but I was just trying be... to understand why we have two fences of very different heights and very different design. And I, and well, I well, let me add another part. thing. If you look at the pictures that I've included, um, the fence, uh, okay, on the front, hold on. The one on the west side of the house, you can't even see it with all the vegetation. I mean, you can see a little bit of it. But on the west side of, I mean, on the front of the house, I'm just looking through these pictures. Um, it sits on stone. You saw that, right? Yes, we did. But just for the sake of saving time. 
his question was simply, can it be replicated? You really don't know. That's okay. I really, I would have to say that would be difficult, if not impossible. All right. So if, if that's okay, if your if you're, uh, question has been answered, Gerald, you're all good with that? Yeah, no, I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. And then we'll, we'll get to more design stuff a little bit later, Holly, but thank okay. you. Um, Dave Matthews, any questions for the applicant, please? Okay. So I'll, I'll um, build off of Gerald's and Gerald, I, I understand where you're coming from, but so if the fence was lower and where it married into the new fence married into the um, existing fence, if you took the horizontal lines and decreased the fence height, but matched the horizontal lines and came across to the house, um, you would have fences that are, um, you know, a little bit more harmonious, uh, don't look like they were um, haphazard. And would you be open to, you know, investigating a uh, direction like that with a lower fence, but um, trying to match up some of the horizontal lines uh, of the existing fence? Uh, meaning not with circles, just having the points, Doesn't, uh, the rods? Not even the points, just the, the horizontal line. Uh, just bring that all the way across, maybe both horizontal lines. So at least they look like they're- Oh, they're talking. separated. Yeah. Uh, similar to what is there on the other fence. I wouldn't have a problem with that. The horizontal. You're matching the horizontal the points. Heights. Yeah. Yeah. No, you don't even, I wouldn't even yeah, say you, you would don't need even it. need the points, just the horizontal yeah. having the same space. Yeah. Uh, that so my question would, would appeal to me. To okay. That's my yes. only question. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And Kirsten, questions for the applicant? Um, I would add to the fence conversation, but no questions. <laughs> okay. All right. Very good. Well, Kirsten, by, by adding, do you mean what do you agree with it or? Um, what worries me about Dave's comment is if we're not hitting that 48 inches at the horizontal, that won't necessarily work. You know what I mean? Um, we don't know where those horizontals are running exactly on the existing fence. I, I completely understand the desire to have, to, to have a four foot fence rather than a, you know, a six foot fence. Um, in my opinion, I think that the wrought iron with the open spear is most compatible to what's there, but that's just my opinion. And then let it disappear. I, I'm just concerned that you couldn't match the horizontal to the correct height to meet code. And then you're up to a high fence again but I wouldn't know without knowing the measurements of the existing fence. I have those. Oh. Somewhere. It's like 66 inches, the fence, the existing fence. Right, I, I just don't, I'm wondering what the heights are of the horizontal components of the fence are. Oh, okay, are. I don't have that. that I yeah. Have. But I would be willing to match that I'd be okay if we're going there. I mean, I mean, I'd be okay with either option. If you, if you know, just that it has some relation to the existing fence. Okay. Any other questions? Chris. Yes. This is Deborah. I just wanted to add to what Karsten, uh, Karsten and David were talking about, and I just say that maybe also in addition to what they've suggested, that the interval between the rails might also match or at least be uh, different enough so it's not almost matching the space between the vertical. The that would be co-driven, I imagine. Good point. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking if there was enough contrast mm -hmm. that it wasn't kind of sort of matching. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank okay. you. Any any other questions? Yeah, we usually have our uh, code guy here with us, but we don't today about, uh, you know, what the minimum and maximum um, spacing of, of the fence uh, elements are. Um, four inches. Four, so what's that four mean? It, that it has to, it can't be less than four inches or it can't be more? It has to be a maximum, a minimum of, sorry, maximum of four inches. I'm imagining four. a pool fence. 
is the same as every other. Okay. So Dave, if you know otherwise. Yeah, a, a four inch sphere cannot pass yeah. through the, uh, between the two verticals is the code, I believe. Mm -hmm. I've also noticed a comment in the chat about New York State Building Code related to pool fences. I don't know how that figures into our conversation. So I would just um, ignore uh, comments from the chat because we're not using the chat function. Uh, that would not be something we would typically have in a hearing, and that's not information that's available for our, the general public. Um, so it's not something that could be foiled. So we're not using that chat function. So that's just a general statement for the rest of this hearing for everyone. It, it's four inches. <laughs> okay, yeah. but yeah. We're, we're still in the question phase. Does anyone have any more questions for the applicant? Okay, thank you, board members. Um, Chris Snyder, public testimony. Yes, there are two pieces of public testimony, which I'm going to skip to now as quickly as possible. Okay. So I'm going to read uh, public testimony for case two for 76 Beach Avenue. Um, all public hearing, uh, all public test or public, I'm, I apologize. All public comments needed to be submitted by five o'clock yesterday uh, to our office in order to be included in the public record. Our first comment came in on November 17th from Andrew Galina. Um, and he states that uh, dear members of the preservation board, I'm writing to you to offer support for proposal to construct an in-ground pool and fencing at the property at 476 Beach Avenue. There is certainly adequate space for the installation of the pool and will not compromise the site in any way. The pool will be a very nice enhancement for the property and the grand home that sits on it. As neighbors at 534 Beach Avenue for over 20 years, we are well aware of the area and strongly encourage the board to approve this application. The second uh, piece of uh, documentation submitted was uh, submitted yesterday. Um, and it is uh, from Sandra Pinkney at 377 Beach Avenue. Um, so I will read all of these comments in. Please find below my comments to read into the record during the virtual hearing December 2nd, 2020. Please provide extra with a copy of record 10 minutes of the hearing. Um, the notice does not inform the recipient as to the designation of the property as a national landmark, nor does it cite its location within a local preservation district. While this information is inherent to the Rochester Preservation Board conducting the hearing, many recipients would not know this. The notice states the action also requires an area variance, but in addition to what? A certificate of appropriateness, perhaps? Three, it appears on the aerial map that this property's green space is already deficient or that coverage is excessive, and the green space is located primarily on the waterfront and not in the front yard. The swimming pool will remove more green space and increase coverage. Isn't an area variance required for this as well as fencing, et cetera? Four, the notice does not cite property's location within a New York State critical environmental area, land and more specifically a bluff within 100 feet of Lake Ontario. And the last I knew, but have not yet verified, also located within a coastal erosion hazard area. The EAF part one does not address this. Five, the RPB is conducting this hearing but wouldn't an area variance require a hearing by the zoning board? Six, excavation within a New York state critical environmental area is also within a coastal erosion hazardous, within a coastal erosion hazardous area is prohibited and exceptions to this regulation do not include swimming pools of any size and the pool location would be on the bluff. Please advise as to why this application is being considered. Seven, the property is located within the West Beach division and all property owners within this subdivision have a legal stake in the integrity of the bluff and the beach. If this application continues to be entertained then all property owners within the West Beach subdivision should be notified of the pending action prior to the city's taking any action. The notice should be more transparent than the one I received. Eight, the property may be listed as a single family but technically there are two structures on the property which provide living space, the National Landmark Home and the oversized two car garage with a bedroom and bath on the second floor as evidenced online in photos of the property and in advertisements for sale two years ago. Is a bedroom over a detached garage and approved use in the R1 or was this specifically permitted? In addition, this pro property exceeds city standards for access to the right of way. 
there are two driveway aprons and not one. And I assume this was grandfathered in, but still is non-conforming with city standards. Also the expansive parking area exceeds city standards relating to parking. There are five bedrooms. So two spaces in the garage and three spaces on the lot. The parking area can and has on many occasions provided for at least six plus vehicles in addition to those in the garage. And this is front yard parking. Understandably off street parking on this property must be front yard, but it is already excessive. 10, I heard several neighbors at the time Ms. Creek pur purchased the home that it was her intention to renovate the property for use as a bed and breakfast, which I believe is only permitted if the property is owner occupied. The word was that Mrs. Creek did not intend to live in the home. None of this is substantiated, but I mention it because if true, the application may precede her, precede her application for change of use to a bed and breakfast establishment and a swimming pool may be intended to enhance commercial use of the property. If so, then installation of the pool and a side yard where coverage parking and right of way access are already excessive. This is of major concern to many of the neighborhood given that when 346 Beach Avenue was sold several years ago, the new owner began using the short-term rentals by the day. Beach Avenue was sold by the day, weekend, week, month, etc. And when not least, the property is vacant and this use seems to be blessed by the city and we do not want it to be a precedent for 476 or any other properties in the R1. In summary, I'm asking the city to provide me a written response which addresses each of my comments and that prov provides assurance that this property will not be used as short-term rental in addition to the minutes of the hearing. Um, so this is Tom Worth from the legal department. Uh, so the, the applicants are uh, going to be allowed to address the fact issues here, but since there are a lot of, uh, kind of legal issues brought up here that need unpacking and to save everyone time, uh, we researched this issue and, and the coastal hazard erosion map. Uh, the the place of the pool is not in the coastal erosion hazard area. Uh, the site, the property is in a coastal consistency zone, but pools being uh, type two actions under CEQA are not subject to review under coastal consistency. Uh, the concerns expressed about a possible bed and breakfast are an issue of, uh, for code enforcement there's been no allegations presented to code enforcement that uh, the property is being operated as an unauthorized bed and breakfast or hotel or uh, anything not consistent with its single family uh, R1 zoning. Um, the notices uh, with regard to this matter uh, were sent in accordance with uh, the zoning code to all properties within 600, the owners of all properties within 600 feet. Uh, the staff reports for this that have a lot more detail, including much of the information that the commenter wanted, uh, were posted online about a week prior uh, to this hearing. Uh, we've checked with our uh, business uh, information system records and the garage uh, was given a prior zoning approval several years ago and therefore is compliant. Uh, the driveway uh, is also compliant and there is no restriction, just as any driveway in the city, in how many cars you can park in the driveway uh, when the driveway is legal. Um, I, I think that's it for the legal issues, but I just wanted to address those to allow the applicant to address uh, the, any, any fact issues that she wishes to address. And Tom, can I add something as well? Uh, that really we're looking at the aesthetics mostly as a board and whether that's appropriate in a preservation district. Agreed. Yep. Anything that would fit into the standards of review. So a lot of this really doesn't affect us, but uh, Mrs. Creek, if you'd like to rebut any of that, you're more than welcome to. Well, I would like to say that um, Ms. Pinckney, um, quote unquote, she keeps saying, I heard from several neighbors, quote unquote, none of this is substantiated, quote unquote. I assume this was grandfathered in. 
quote unquote, I mentioned this it because if it's true, so none of it's true. And regarding, I'm going to start at the end first, that I would open a bed and breakfast. <laughs> That's pretty comical. There are two people that live in that house, 360 days a year, two people, me and my husband. That's it. And maybe somebody comes like one of my kids for two days and that's about it. So we have two, we have three vehicles, one that sometimes I leave them all outside. Otherwise two are in the garage. One is out in the driveway. Uh, we live alone there. So bed and breakfast that I don't, I have no idea where that even came from. Now with regard to, um, the, uh, tur the driveway, that has been there for decades. That didn't just arrive five years ago. The carriage house is 18 years old, and that was all permitted, like you said. Um, the West Beach subdivision, which we're all members of, the association, which we love dearly, we love to see the people walking on the beach or walking on the sidewalk. We love it, and that's why we live there. But to for them to think that they have uh, a legal stake in my front yard and what I do with it, no, I pay the taxes. And I think that just about sums it up. Thank you. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Snyder, deliberations? Yep, so this is the uh, deliberation section for this case, uh, 476 Beach Avenue the third case we're hearing tonight, or I'm sorry, the second case we're hearing tonight. Um, just as a reminder to everyone that board members uh, review cases and take action by voting and that no members of the public uh, or applicants can speak during this time. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Um, so now we'll, board, board members will discuss and vote. Uh, Deborah Beardsley, did you want to start? You want to give us your thoughts, please? Deborah, can you hear me? I'm sorry, I was muted. Okay. Yes, I can. Sorry, Chris, I was muted. Okay. Um, this seems like a careful, high quality application. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure about the second letter that we heard, but it sounds like much, if not all of that is not in our, is not in our territory for the preservation board to assess or comment on. In terms of the carefulness of the plan and the, um, the proposed location of the pool and materials, et cetera, I think, it's, I think it is a good application and I would reference back to our comments a little bit earlier for this application. I, I support the idea of trying to, as much as possible, have the new fencing speak to, as David said, the, um, the existing older fencing, at least in some way, so that it just feels harmonious on the site. Thank you, Deborah. Those are my comments. Okay, thank you. Um, alphabetically, I'm next. Um, I said earlier, I think it's a great application. It is, all the quality materials is uh, very high quality. I think it's really well done. Several of these historic homes have these pools, Fletcher Steel uh, design pools, um, really well done. As far as the fence is concerned that, that they would like to put in, I actually agree with the applicant. I, I think that fence needs to be less noticeable but still you know, uh, be in harmony with the other. I think if we start to get too fancy with that fence, it's gonna look horrible. Cause it's really not, I agree. Large, really not that large an area. I really like what they've proposed. I think it's tasteful. I think it, it respects the uh, original fencing, but it, it does its job. Um, I really think every single, I, I'm in agreement with every detail of this application. Very well done, including the fence. Um, Kajana? Um, I uh, think the uh, proposal was uh, well uh, thought out, well put together. 
uh, I like the ad additional details in terms of uh, existing um, garden pools and pools uh, in the area. I uh, do not have any problems with uh, the proposed fence. And um, I, uh, I think it's very positive. Looking at it is very positive. Thank you, Kajana. Jim Devini. Chris, may I, I'm sorry, may I clarify my earlier comment? Sure. Chris, I just wanna make sure I was clear enough. Sure. I, I, um, I agree with the applicant's decision to have a quieter fence as the new portion. So when I said harmonious with the existing older fence, I didn't mean a replica or a duplicate. I meant that perhaps something, there could be some visual conversation between both fences, if even quiet, but I agree with a quieter lower fence there um, that kind of melts away. I agree with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jim Devaney? Yes. Um... When I was driving out to the lake to see this site, I have to admit, I was prejudiced against the whole idea. But once I saw the location and I saw the layout of the land and fully understood the type of swimming pool that the applicant was proposing, I began to see the, um, the, the beauty of it. And um, I, I was won over because I, I think that it's very sensitive to the surroundings and to the house. and um, you know, it's, it's not a family swimming pool. It's something, uh, she refers to it as a garden pool. And I thought that sounded silly until I saw it. And then I, I bought into it. I, I think this is a very lovely proposal and uh, I'm prepared to support it all the way, even right down to her after intentions with the fence. Thank you, Jim. Gerald Gam. Um, so I wanna be clear. I think the proposal for the pool as all the rest of you have said, is an excellent proposal. Uh, standing there, looking at the property, imagining the pool embedded in the yard. It's a very good location for the pool. It's a nice treatment for, for this piece of land. Um, it's sympathetic to the historic house and to the historic district. And the materials that are being used for the pool, I think are entirely appropriate. I do have issues with the fence. I think that the fence that is proposed bears no relation to the existing fence and you're going to have two black wrought iron fences side by side. One intersects with the other on both sides of the house that are different heights and entirely different designs. So I would, my vote tonight would be to approve the proposal for the pool and to hold the portion of the proposal that relates to the fence and ask the applicant to come back with images of the existing fence and images of new fencing that tie in more sympathetically to the existing fence. I will note for the record that there is no image of the existing fence in the proposal, even though it's a very long proposal. I can hold up my photograph that would be helpful to the board, um, which I have on my phone, but I think it would be helpful for all of us to see an image of the existing fence and to see proposed new fencing seeing how it ties into the existing fence, both in terms of height and in terms of design. Okay, thank you. Hold up my uh, photo, I can do that. I just don't know if that's the right way for us to be well, examining I think fencing. I, that's, that's the reason why we visit the property personally, I think, I mean, to, mm -hmm. to look at that. Uh, okay. But if the board would like to see it, I'm happy to do it. Anything else? Okay, anyways, that, 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 is, that is my thought. I would. I would approve the pool without hesitation. I think it's completely appropriate. And in approving the pool, we're obviously approving some fence, but I would hold the specific fence until we had images of the existing fence to look at side by side with images of new fencing. Thank you. David Matthews. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have any problem with the pool. I think, um, you know, the fact that it, it's smaller, um, garden type pool uh, uh, is fine. I think the materials and, and the proposal uh, with all of that, um, the area around it um, is harmonious with the, with the site and um, you know, the landscape and, and garden. Um, as far as the fence, I'll, I'll kind of stand by the other, 
the comments I made before, um, if the, and I, I don't mind the, the proposed fence it's in the application, it says this, this is an example of a new fence. It didn't say it was the new fence. Mm -hmm. So if um, the building code and zoning code requirements were met by matching the horizontals on the existing fence and carried across, I think it would marry in and match better with the existing fence. So um, I would, uh, uh, if it for some reason it does not, then I think um, you know the owner should should look harder at um, uh, other options. Um, and it didn't specifically say that there was any any uh, um, concrete option that they, they were looking at. So um, that would be um, what I would be in in approval for. Um, that kind of direction of mirroring in the new fence and the, the existing fence, not necessarily matching them per se. Okay. Thanks, David. And Karsten? Um, a lot of the same comments. Um, I think that the precedents that were provided in the application were very helpful for um, convincing us that a pool in this area makes sense. Um, full approval, <laughs> the fence conversation, I think it's, in my opinion, I would leave it up to the owner's discretion. I think a shorter fence that dissolves and disappears is the way to go. And whether that's matching a horizontal or, you know, to me, again, I think having the, having the open spears helps in dissolving the way that this fence is put together. I would leave it up to the owner as long as the color match the existing and the pickets are round or square to match the existing and that there's a relationship between the two fences. Okay. Well, thank you, board members. Uh, any, would anyone like to give us a motion? Kirsten? Sure. Um, I would like to motion for case number two, file number A-023-20-2020. To install a 12 by 24 in-ground gunite concrete pool in the side yard of the home and to install a code compliant pool fence that is not that is in keeping with the existing fence in color and to the owner's discretion of a shorter height i would like to see at least a matching picket um, be approved kirsten are you willing to also require a matching horizontal? Well, it's gonna need a horizontal somewhere. Back to what I was saying with Dave's comment, if the matching horizontal is at 37 inches, well, yeah, sure, if, if it can make it work, it just can't be the cap of the fence if it doesn't match the correct height. But if I, I, I think it would be nice if that could happen, yes. But May I ask a question? So I could add that to the proposal. Yes, go ahead, go ahead, Deborah. What would be the downside of following Gerald's suggestion and um, having two having two votes or, or voting on approving the pool and tabling or holding the fence? Well, I don't, well, I don't think that the majority, I'm, keep, I'm taking temperature of the, the board of the board members here in keeping with it, I don't think the majority really went there based on their comments. It will, it'll drag it out to another meeting um, mm -hmm. when in, when in fact, if most of board, if most of the board members were okay with the fence, the way it is, um, it would save a board meeting basically. Um, Chris, can I just point out Kirsten's motion? And this is, I guess, simply my confusion. Kirsten's motion is not for the fence the way it is, but us trying to modify the fence to be more sympathetic to the existing fence. And I think my only question is Deborah's question is, are we able to accomplish that through the motion? I, I understand. I, I think what Kirsten was saying or what she was, was trying to give the applicant a little bit more leeway with it, uh, but still kind of putting guards around it, if you will. Um, and to some degree, these fences. Kirsten, sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry. 
I was just saying most of these fences are off the shelf anyway, where they're going to be, you know, their stock, they're going to be what they are. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. Um, I I think I think I would trust the owner to make the right call and that it's again, sympathetic to the existing, but is shorter and, you know, or we already have the right idea with the right color and the right, you know, open look to some degree. Yeah. And and not just color, right. It's wrought iron material. Right. So would you be willing to basically make make your motion to what was presented? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure. I, I think, you know, if I don't know who said it, but I didn't understand that the applicant wasn't specifically saying that this particular fence is what is being proposed. If, and if that's true, we're leaving it up to the owner's discretion regardless. So... So I would say, sure, if this, if the proposal is to have a fence similar to that proposed in the application, I would, su- I would motion for that to be okay, um, so, supported. All right. So just, for the record, <laughs> so just for the record, if you wouldn't mind starting over and we'll. From the top. From the top. All right. So file number A-023-20-21 for 476 Beach Avenue to motion to approve the installation of a 12 foot by 24 foot in-ground gunite concrete pool in the side yard of the home and a wrought iron black fence of a similar character to that that is proposed in the application. Second. Okay, so a motion has been made by Kirsten Solberg and uh, properly seconded by Jim Divini. We will now alphabetically go down and take a vote. So we'll start with Deborah Beardsley. Do you vote yay for that motion, Deborah? And you might be muted. Yeah, I'm not muted. It's a tough vote because oh. I'm I'm not in. I'm not. Sh- I don't feel we're being consistent about the amount of detail that we're asking for on this fence proposal compared to other applications. So I'm, I'm, but the majority of the application I'm in favor of. So I'm gonna vote yay, but I'm concerned about consistency. Okay, so you vote yay on that motion. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so Deborah Beardsley votes yay. Next would be me, Christopher Coretta. I vote yay on the motion. Kajana Crawford. I vote yay on the motion. Kajana Crawford votes yay. Jim Devinney? I vote yay. Jim Devinney votes yay on the motion. Gerald Gam? I vote nay. Gerald Gam votes nay. David Matthews? I vote yay. David Matthews votes yay. And Kirsten Solberg? Kirsten? You're, you're muted. There you go. Um, I vote yay. Sorry. Well, Kirsten Solberg votes yay. So we have one, two, three, four, five. So of the seven, uh, six are yay, one is nay. So that means it was passed. Thank you very much to the applicant. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna go to the third case tonight. Case three tonight is uh, a certificate of appropriateness case, A-023-20, I'm sorry, A-024-20-21. Uh, the applicant is Joseph Thon, who's the pro- property owner for 1307 Park Avenue. Uh, the proposal is to replace four existing extruded vinyl windows on the third floor of this single family home by replacing them with aluminum clad wood windows. Um, all board members present have visited this site. Thank you, Chris. And Joseph Thon, are you with us? Is Joseph with us? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. 
Welcome, Joseph. Um, I just have to swear you in. Do you, Joseph Thon, solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Great. Thank you very much. And we're ready for your presentation. Thank you. Um, so back in November of 2019, I as a member of Victor Bruce Properties LLC, purchased this single family home um, at 1307 Park Ave. Um, under Once under contract, it was discovered that the property used to be a uh, hockey player house for the local junior hockey program, primarily eight males aged 18 to 22 years old. Due to revolving tenancies, the age and maturity of previous tenants and a lack of oversight by an agent or owner, the property uh, what was acquired in poor condition. Uh, since we purchased the home, many improvements were made to the property, most notably a new furnace and hot water heater. We then implemented an active management system, in, including regular interior cleaning, landscaping, and lawn service. We also worked diligently to place tenants who are respectful of the property, the neighbors, and the community. Our objective is plain. We want to create and manage a quality home in the Park Avenue neighborhood. Um, when we did purchase the home, the certificate of occupancy uh, was transferred to Victor Bruce as owner of the property. And this, ex this certificate expires on October 24, 2024. We assumed ownership of this property was transferred absent codes, violation or other regulatory issues. This assumption derived from our reliance upon attorneys who conducted the due diligence. We were frustrated to learn of the unapproved replacement windows and our concerns only grew as the facts were shared with us. Um, we've put together this application because we want to comply with uh, the Rochester Preservation Board. We are invested in the area. We have other rental properties in the area and it was uh, unfortunate that we had to f find out uh, the windows were installed by the previous owner without approval. Um, so we're just trying to correct that issue. Uh, we weren't aware of it upon our purchase and we just wanna do right by the city and the preservation board. Great, well, thank you very much. We appreciate you working with us. Well, um, we're going to go around to all the members of the board individually and if they have any questions um we'll do this alphabetically i'll start with kirsten with we'll the bottom going up this time kirsten do you have any questions for the applicant i have no questions thank you thank you david matthews any questions for the applicant i have no questions i appreciate the thoroughness of the and uh clearness of the uh, proposal it's not often we get um full pictures around the house with um you know designations of exactly what you're doing so we appreciate that thank you and Gerald Gam, any questions for the applicant no questions at all just to second what dave says thank you for the very clear application thank you um mr Davini, any questions i have no questions at this time and Kajana Crawford, any questions for the applicant? No questions, and thank you for wanting to improve your property. Thank you, Kajana. Um, I'm next. Again, thank you very much for working with us. I have no questions. Uh, and Deborah Beardsley, any questions for the applicant? I don't have any questions. I think this application has a lot of integrity. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Chris Snyder, public comments, please. Yes, we have one public comment for this case. Um, as a reminder to the public, um, all uh, cases, or all public comments had to be submitted by five o'clock yesterday, December 1st, to be included in uh, today's meeting and public hearing of these items. Uh, so this came from David Austin at 1313 Park Avenue. Uh, he writes, the owner of 1307 Park Avenue, Joseph Thon, has been a negligent absent landlord who has let his property deteriorate with missing gutters, missing handrails, peeling paint, garbage dumped in the backyard, and construction debris that was left after an interior renovation. The property currently has outstanding code violations. There has been continued use of the third floor as living space that is not legalized, and the number of unrelated individuals residing at the property exceeds that what is allowed by city code. 
Building and zoning staff, as well as the administrator of the Southeast Neighborhood Service Center have been notified of problems as this nuisance property on numerous occasions, but have failed to address them. In June of this year, the owner removed the original front door of the home and replaced it without application or approval from the Preservation Board. Gary Kirkmeyer, Commissioner of Neighborhood and Business Development and Daisy Elgarin of Southeast Neighborhood Service Center were both notified of this in written form, but some unknown reasons, buildings and zoning staff declined to issue a violation. This is another example of the city of Rochester not being consistent in issuing violations for modifying properties within the preservation district. While I appreciate the owner's attempt to improve the property, I'm asking that the preservation board hold this application until the city of Rochester staff properly address violations with the owner and provides an explanation as to why the front door replacement did not result in a violation. Um, so this is sort of a, a comment, uh, obviously just a general comment um, to the board members, but I did want to address uh, the allegation by the applicant that uh, there are open violations on this property. There are no open violations on this property at this time. Um, that's, that's all I have to say. Uh, no further public comments. Nope, that was the only public comment for this case. Um, Mr. Thon, if you wanted to speak to any of this, you're, you're welcome to it. You have five minutes to rebut. Sure. Thanks. Um, I believe that the, uh, the, this person, David is referencing a lot of resentment from the previous owner. This was a, this was a hockey house. I don't know if you guys are aware of what uh, 18, 19 year old hockey players do to houses. But I can tell you when we walked in to, to look at this house to buy it, it was in, in quite a mess. And I'm sure that years and years of housing uh, players with that kind of uh, attitude towards a house, I'm sure they're, they're very discouraged uh, as neighbors. Um, I can tell you for a fact that the previous owners were putting six, seven, eight guys uh, in that house at a time. Um, they got, I guess they get traded a lot. So kids just come in from nowhere. And the owner of the Rochester Monarchs uh, was the old owner of this property. And so he would just bring guys in, throw them in the house. And it was kind of like a frat house. Um, that is not what this house is now. Um, I, I do believe it will take some time for the neighbors to realize that. Um, this house has been rented out to a group of girls who are very nice. They keep the property uh, intact. Um, there was some garbage out back that I guess they had a bonfire. Uh, and I think this guy is referring to, to that as in, in terms of what was uh, in the backyard. Um, you know, they're just kids being kids. Uh, I'm not really sure what else to say about that. Um, let's see what else was in here. Um, there, uh, the front door, I painted the front door and I notified this, the city, uh, inspector of that. Um, I don't know. I didn't, I don't know what else I have to do regarding that quite frankly. Um, and that's about it. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, we'll close the public portion and members will deliberate. So, uh, we're gonna start the deliberations for this case now as a reminder to the general public um, board, this is a closed deliberation. So there is no interaction uh, with the applicants or the public at this time. Okay, thank you, Chris. So we'll start with Deborah. Deborah, what are your thoughts on this application? Hi there, I appreciated the applicant's um, explanation following the, the letter that you read, Chris Snyder. And um, I understand many of the points that the applicant made in response. Uh, one question I had was just about the, the door and I wanna make sure that I understood um, 
uh, Mr. Thon, you said that you have painted the door. Does that mean you painted it, you didn't replace it, and you think someone's misunderstood that, or you replaced it and you painted it? I painted it, and I painted the side door to the house the same color, um, and then I put, screen, I put screen doors in front of those two doors. So I don't know if that's allowed either. Yeah, I was just responding to the letter that Chris Snyder read about. Um, yeah, I, I, this is Tom Worth from the legal department. We've uh, investigated the complaints and there's no pending violations. So in the interests of uh, kind of getting through these cases, I think we got to try to focus back on this application, which is about replacing windows. Mm -hmm. Good point, Tom. Thank you. I don't have any other questions, Chris. Thank, thanks, Deborah. I have no questions. Uh, Kijana, any questions for the applicant? No, I have no questions. Thank you. Thanks, Kijana. Jim Devini, questions for the applicant? No questions. Thank you. Gerald Gam, any questions for the applicant? Chris, I may be wrong, but I think we already did questions for the applicant. Yeah, we're, we're in deliberations. Yeah. We're not uh, in questions. I'm sorry. You're right. I apologize. I'll, I'll come up with a question if you really want me to, but I think we're in deliberations. Uh, you're, you're right. Thank you for helping me. Um, I, I'll start again. I, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start again. Um, my thoughts about this, it's very straightforward. He just wants to replace four windows, which uh, follow our guidelines. I have no issues with it at all. I would completely support this application. We'll go back to you, Kajana. I apologize. I support the application. Thank you. Jim Devinney? I support the application. And Gerald? I support the application with one reservation. I think this is a perfect application in terms of what's being done with the house. We're, we're taking off uh, vinyl replacement windows, which were inappropriate in the first place, and putting back uh, and putting on the house windows that are much more appropriate for the house. My only reservation, I just want to state it for the record, um, since the hearing is on record, is I don't think it's, I, I'm made uncomfortable by, by the comments of the applicant suggesting that 18 to 21 year old men um, are less able to keep a house than 18 to 21 year old women or that athletes are less able to keep a house than non-athletes. I just wanna state for the record as somebody who teaches college students that the vast majority of students that I interact with are this age and are responsible. And so that's the only part of the application that I'm uncomfortable with, and I just want to state it for the record. Thank you. David Matthews, your thoughts on this application, please. Um, uh, I'm in support of the application. I think it's uh, uh, appropriate for the, the um, aluminum clad wood windows to be replacing the vinyl windows, uh, more in keeping with the historic character and nature of the, the um, neighborhood. So I'm in complete support of the application. Thank you. And Kirsten? Um, I support the application. It's an upgrade in the right direction. Great. Thank you. And can I get a motion, Gerald? Do you want to give me a motion? Sure. Yes. Happily. Um, so I'm making a motion regarding file number A 024 2, I'm sorry, A 024 20 21 at 1307 Park Avenue to replace four existing vinyl windows on the third floor of the single family home with aluminum clad wood windows that we approve the application as submitted. Second. A motion has been made by Gerald Gam and seconded by Deborah Beardsley. I will now call for a vote uh, in alphabetical order. We'll start with Deborah Beardsley. Deborah, how do you vote? I vote yay. Yay for the motion, Deborah Beardsley. I'm next, Christopher Coretta. I vote yay for the motion. Kajana Crawford? Yay. Kajana Crawford votes yay for the motion. Jim Devinney? Vote yay. Jim Devinney votes yay for the motion. Gerald Gam? I vote yay. Gerald Gam votes yay for the motion. David Matthews? I vote yay. David Matthews votes yay. And Kirsten Solberg? Yay. Kirsten Solberg votes yay. It's unanimous. Thank you very much, Mr. Thon. Thank you. Uh, 
Okay. Next hearing item is A dash zero two five dash zero dash two one dash two zero dash two one. Uh, this is a application for a certificate of appropriateness for 11 Arnold Park. The applicant is Pepsi Ketavong, who is the property owner. Uh, and the purpose is to repair and replace portions of the front porch, including the replacement of two wood porch columns with two new fiberglass porch columns, walkway and driveway at the site of this single family home. Um, all board members present have visited this site. Great. Thank you, Mr. Snyder. Pepsi, are you with us? Yes. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. There you are. I can see you too. Um, I just need to swear you in. Do you, Pepsi Ketavong, solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We are ready for your application, sir. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd um, just like to say thank you for uh, to the, all the board members for you doing just a wonderful job to, you know, be the bear between the historic integrity in our city. So I really appreciate what you do for me personally. Um, well, my wife and I moved in this neighborhood probably about three, four years ago. And obviously we love this neighborhood and, and uh, we love the architecture. And what we since we live here, Obviously, you know, living on a historic house, there's always some challenges. So what we propose to do, as if you already visited the, the site there, is to replace and um, repair the, um, restore the, um, the railing. Um, so what we're gonna do, so what I'll do is walk you through exactly what we do and how that came about. Is that, is that okay? Does that work? Perfect. Yes. Okay. Um, well, the first thing we're going to do is that we're going to remove the uh, existing raw iron uh, railing. We're going to take that and uh, have it uh, sandblasted and restored back to original and modify some little um, structural mechanics. Um, because right now, the way it's installed, it's actually mounted right onto the, the column itself. Um, actually, that would cause some structural problem in the long term. And as the concrete um, porch, it's essentially crumbling. So we want to demo and remove the existing shelf and recast it in place. And the existing concrete step to be removed, form and pour new concrete stair to match design and remove the stairs. If, you, if you're looking at the drawings, um, Drawings number uh, sheet number A one o four. If you're looking at the on the right, on the left hand corner, right there. If you see that the the, the second one right to from the left, that you see that curvature is coming out. That's actually this original. So whoever. Um, or the slab onto the original uh, slab actually extend that. So we're actually gonna bring it back to the original by reusing that curvature. I thought that would be a wonderful uh, uh, design the overall aesthetic of this, the architecture there. So, and then, and what we wanted to do is that remove the concrete walkway and install with a new uh, a brick pavers, brick like paver, which we were gonna get it from the Miller brick. Uh, it's similar to uh, a house towards the north side. Uh, it's a house right next to the Zen Center that actually have that uh, concrete walkway. Um, I mean, not concrete, but the, uh, um, the um, um, brick walkway. I think that would be uh, a nice, uh, designed to bring it back to that uh, historic field rather than a concrete. And the last thing that we wanted to do is to install the curve, um, the, you know, bring out the existing curve for the driveway. Um, as you can see, 
and the drawings that's shown right now, you see this area? So we want to define that curve. Believe it or not, it literally took us about three years to really decide what we wanted to do <laughs> with this uh, um, driveway. And obviously you can do, you know, asphalt, concrete, and it just, it was really difficult decision to make. So we decided to just give that nice curve outlining the, 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 um, the, the, the driveway, but also give a clear definition transition from the, the grass and the stone. So that gives it a little of that rustic feel, even though the maintenance every winter, we're gonna have to move that stone back. So uh, uh, I thought that overall, we were gonna enjoy that long-term. So essentially, that's some summarized. Now, with respect to the column, one of the things I want to say about the columns is that we did actually explore to restore it. And I mean, we, we, we thought about maybe, you know, uh, uh, put, uh, put epoxy in it and glue it in it. It just beyond the repair or restoration. restoration. So the challenge was that, how do we get something that not only would capture the aesthetics of the architecture, but also give you a long-term structure integrity? So we came up with the idea of finding the capital that matches the existing uh, uh, capital that we have now, and also using a column that's not fluted, uh, but is smooth surface. Uh, at the end, it'll give us the aesthetic that we want, but also provide that long-term uh, structure integrity we need. Now, the other thing that I want to note out, the old column had been run so bad that if you literally look at the pitch of the roof there, it literally dropped about two and a half inches. And it literally pulled out the clapboard and we had to literally jack it up a little bit and replace some of those uh, uh, clapboard that popped out from the uh, uh, connections between the, the, the roof and the siding. So, and that's pretty much what we, uh, my end of my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very good, very thorough. And it's a very cool house, by the way. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna do a round robin now for questions. We'll start with Kirsten. Kirsten, do you have any questions for the applicant? Um, my only question is, you mentioned that you looked into the restoration of the column. Did you consider the rep? Um, I know you proposed using a fiberglass column. Was there any exploration into a wood column as a, um, as a replacement? Yeah, we did explore that. The, the only the problem is even the, the capital, you can't get mm -hmm. any replica on that. The only way you can really get that capital, you got to make a mold, cast it, and then inject some sort of resin in it to get that a capital. Yeah. And the challenge with remaking this wooden column is that you have a lot of weight holding up there. And then you have yeah. a wooden structure that's being contacted to the concrete. And that's the mm -hmm. worst thing that could happen. <clears throat> Let me ask one more crazy question. With your conversation with your architect, is there any possibility to use a fiberglass shaft and then keep the existing capital? Uh, Almost a hybrid? A possibility. I, I can tell you this, looking at this right now, and literally I was out there today, you can literally see the gap, the deterioration. Uh, 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 if you look, if you get the ladder, go above it, look at the capital, mm -hmm. there's some deterioration okay. right in there too, so. Yeah. Because you can clearly see what a mess the, the base is, but it's hard to see what condition the capital is in. Yeah. But thank and you, that clarifies that. that. The, the way these things can be painted, you know what I mean? It's going to be blend in exactly uh, uh, what the, you know, the color scheme that we have for this house. Okay. All right, that answers my questions. Thank you. Hey, Dave Matthews, questions? Um. Just wondering if there was any damage to the half columns that are attached to the house, or uh, it looks like you weren't going to replace those. Or, so was there any damage to those? And, and how closely is the, um, the fiberglass column going to match that uh, half column? Are they pretty, are they exact replicas or, or 
extremely close. Uh, are you asking the columns that's actually a uh, 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 flush against the house? That's correct. Yeah. That that's totally different design. That's kind of like a, a, a rectangular shapes. When you ask about is is there damage? Not really damage. The the only damage which is easily repaired by putting maybe bondo and you know sand it down and then sand it. And the part yeah. that caused that is the fact that they actually drill the railing into that bond. And that's what's got. So you had a couple of, of um, uh, um, you know, screw holes and things like that. So it's in pretty good condition. It's good condition. Yeah, I just and, and the question about matching was more about the capital, the the ionic, the ionic capital on top. Um, since you're you're taking away the the old wood one and replacing with a fiberglass one, are you going to end up with something as a close match with the with the one attached to the house? and the one at the uh, at the new column. If you look at the, um, the what we propose, uh, I'm sorry, I, what is your name again? I'm sorry. You see, look at the cap over there. Yeah, it, lo it looks pretty close. I just wanted to. to it's very sure close to that. Even if we try to get the wooden capital, I don't think they make that anymore. The only way you're going to get the 100% exact, you got to get to make a mold and inject some sort of resin in there. OK. Okay, that's my only questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Cheryl Cam, any questions? I, I have no questions at all. I think that this is a very carefully specified proposal, um, both in terms of the design and materials that are being used for the poetry construction and the brick for the walkway. So I have no questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Davini, any questions? I agree with Gerald in the, on every point he made, and I, I have no questions. All right, um, Kajana Crawford, any questions for the applicant? No, it, uh, it's a proposal that's well thought out, very thorough, and uh, the house has a lot of character to it. I love it. Thank you. Um, I would be next and I would totally agree with Kajana. Uh, Deborah Beardsley, any questions? I think this is a thorough, high quality application. I don't have any questions. Great, thank you. All right, um, Mr. Snyder, any public comments? <clears throat> yes, there was one comment for this uh, application. Um, I'm just going to state again, um, all public comments had to come in by five o'clock yesterday, December 1st, in order to be included in uh, the public uh, hearing of items tonight. Um, this comes from Scott Jennings. Uh, business manager of the Rochester Zen Center. He writes, Dear Sir or Madam, the Rochester Zen Center, 5 and 7 Arnold Park, would like to express its support for the proposed project of our neighbors at 11 Arnold Park. The, rep the proposed repairs and replacements involving the porch, walkway, and driveway will enhance both properties and the block. That was the only um, piece of public testimony we received. Great. Thank you. Um, Pepsi, if you would... I'd like to speak to any of that. You have the right to, you don't have to, but you have five minutes to rebut or say anything about the, the comments that were made. Yeah, um, uh, the other thing that we also got uh, support from, our, uh, when we put the package together, we I actually went to talk to some of the neighbors and just make sure we're a good you know, neighbor and get some of their feedback, some of those comments and express what we were trying to do. So the overwhelmingly, um, that they have supportive of us. So, and they send us email and things like that. So, Great. Okay, thank you, sir. And uh, Chris, that'll close the public portion. Yep, so now we'll go into deliberations. Um, and I'll just state again that uh, uh, this is a closed deliberation where the board reviews the cases. So there's gonna be no participation by applicants or the public. Thank you. So we'll start with comments. I'll get it right this time. Uh, uh, Kirsten, what are your thoughts on this case? Um, I support this application. I think it clearly needs to be done in terms of the capital or the column. Um, my head also went to the same place as Dave about the engaged column and what the relationship would be. But if we're being told that they were already distinct, then I don't think that's an issue. Um, I think that what's being done with the railings is appropriate. And I think the brick paver is also going to be an improvement to the property. 
Great, thank you. Dave Matthews. Yeah, I agree with Kirsten. I, I you know, it's a very nice application. I think um, um, the owner has done uh, nice work in putting together the proposal and documenting everything uh, for us clearly to, to review. And he, uh, it's it's evident that uh, he he cares about the house and, and wants um, to do the right thing. So I, I am full support of the application. Thank you, sir. Uh, Gerald Gam, your thoughts? Uh, I'm, I'm in full support of the application too. I agree entirely with Dave and Kirsten. Um, this is an applicant who obviously loves the house and cares for the house and has worked very, very hard to put together a careful proposal for how to restore the porch uh, to a condition that is as close to as to that it is as close to original as he can get, um, down to repouring the concrete steps, down to exactly the way that, that they were originally poured. Um, and the brick walkway too, I think is fully appropriate. So I love the application and I appreciate all the work uh, that the owners of the house are doing. Great, thank you, Gerald. Uh, Jim Devinney. I know I fully support this proposal. I think the applicant has definitely shown due diligence in planning what he wants to do here and uh, I fully support the idea. Great. And Kajana Crawford, what are your thoughts on this? I support the proposal, it was well thought out. Um, the house um, has a lot of detail, a lot of character to it. And I think that um, um, it's it's a well it's it's a good it's a good very good proposal. I'm I support it. Thank you. Um, I support it as well. Uh, at first, I was a little concerned when I saw the fiberglass uh, columns, but I think it you know once it's painted in place, I think it's actually a, 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 the perfect solution for it. Uh, once you once you uh, walked us through it, Pepsi. Um, but otherwise, the application itself was picture perfect. It was a great job. Thank you. I support it totally. Um, Deborah? I think it's a high quality, thorough application and I really appreciate the applicant's care and also the clear answers that he's provided and the information in this packet. Great. Um, how about a motion? Kajana, did you wanna give me a motion? Sure, okay. I uh, make a motion that we approve um, uh, Apple A dash zero two, no, excuse me, 025 dash 20 dash 21. And um, for uh, 11 Honor uh, Park, uh, for um, uh, the existing porch at uh, has been damaged over time. Uh, existing railing to be removed, repaired, or reinstalled. Existing concrete porch to be prepared, repaired. Uh, existing concrete steps to be removed. Existing uh, columns of damage. Uh, remove existing sidewalk and install submerged driveway. Uh, all as outlined in the proposal. Um, for 11 Honor Park. Okay, I'll second. Uh, that was, was that Dave Matthews? That's correct, yeah. Okay, thank you. So Kajana Crawford made a motion and it was properly seconded by David Matthews. I'll call the vote alphabetically. We'll start with Deborah Beardsley. Yay. Deborah votes yay on the motion. Uh, Christopher Coretta would be me. I vote yay on the motion. Kajana Crawford. I vote nay too. Yay. Kajana Crawford votes yay. Jim Devinney. Yay. Jim Devinney votes yay on the motion. Gerald Gam. I vote yay. Gerald votes yay on the motion. David Matthews. I vote yay. David Matthews votes yay on the motion. And Kirsten Solberg. Yay. Kirsten Solberg votes yay, which is a unanimous yay. Thank you very much for the application, Pepsi. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Okay.
The next case, case 5A-026-20-21, is an application for a certificate of appropriateness. The applicants are Jamie Week um, or Wyke, sorry, Jamie, for mispronunciation, uh, the project architect, and Jeff Sager of 441 East Avenue, LLC. The address is 441 East Avenue, and the purpose is to install windows and a portico at the main entry way vestibule and to install windows on the north and east facades of this existing office building. All board members present have visited the site. Thank you, sir. Okay, Jamie, Jamie Week, am I pronouncing it correctly? Wick. Wick, I'm sorry. Uh, take it here with us, Jamie Wick. I need to swear you in. Uh, do you, Jamie Wick, solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much. And we are ready for your presentation. Uh, yes, uh, Jeff Seeger will start. Oh, I also have to swear Jeff in. Yep. I, I apologize. Do you, uh, Jeff uh, Jeff, Seeger. I'm sorry. Sager, thank you. Do you, Jeff Sager, solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, good evening, and uh, thank you. Um, I'm the uh, property manager and the construction manager for 441 East Avenue, LLC. Um, we recently purchased this building, and it is a vacant office building. Um, we are trying to reuse the existing office space in the building and are marketing it as such. We have a, uh, a potential good tenant that uh, we have not signed a lease with yet, but are close and are working with them. But the building, um, as you can see from the East Avenue side, is very closed off to the street. Um, and one of the biggest things in our purchase of the building was that it had a great view out front. It feels like a park-like building uh, that's in the middle of the city. And um, this was one of the ver our first steps in marketing the property. Um, is trying to add this glass to the front and opening up the building more to the street. Um, we're really looking forward to trying to add this uh, to East Avenue um, and the look and the feel that it would have on the street. I'll let Jamie uh, follow up with all the details of what we're doing. Yeah, so the owner wishes to update the building to be more engaged with the neighborhood and be more desirable for tenants. Uh, building that's out there right now is all flat walls. There's a few punched openings. Uh, it's set back from the streets. It's not very engaged with uh, the street way or anything around it. Um, uh, it's kind of almost a borderline brutalist architecture out there uh, in the East Ave neighborhood. Um, so it's not very in character with uh, the rest of the neighborhood. Um, there are several other examples within the neighborhood of more recent uh, modern or contemporary architecture. Um, and we feel that what we're proposing here is uh, in line with those properties. Um, we've shown some examples of those uh, that are in the district. Um, we would like to add the gla uh, glass along the front there. Uh, I think it will soften the presence along East Avenue and uh, be more engaged so uh, between occupants and the street. Um, we, uh, some of the vocabulary that we're using um, is also repeated throughout the neighborhood on those examples. Um, there's uh, boxy deep frames around windows, um, large glass expanses, um, and modern takes on, on the openings. Um, there's also a sunken courtyard. Um, we are going to replace the glass that is there uh, to be consistent with the new work that we're doing. Uh, there is a CMU wall currently that goes around that sunken courtyard that projects above the grade. Um, we would like to remove that two grade and replace the railing that is out there now with a new um, railing with a cable rail um, so that the railing kind of goes away from the street um, because those the cables are so so fine uh, that we're going to be looking right through it, but still providing that required guard around the opening there. Um, the entryway, uh, currently there is a canopy 
and it is a rather deep, heavy canopy. What we would like to do is infill underneath that with new glass, again, consistent with what we're using, um, and lighten that look up there. Um, that'll be more inviting and a defined entry for visitors to the site. Um, and we feel that the renovations that we are proposing are consistent with similar structures within the district and it will positively contribute to the neighborhood. Okay. okay. Anything else? Nope. Okay. Um, well, it's a, it's a great application personally, I think it's uh, very elegant. Um, we will do a round robin for questions. We'll start with Deborah Beardsley. Any questions for the uh, Not at this time. It's a very intriguing application. Thank Great. you. Th thank you, Deborah. Uh, I have no questions. Kajana Crawford. I have no questions. Thank you, Kajana. Jim Devini, any questions? Um, no, I, I was temporarily confused by the, the, the color rendering on that north face. I love the way you've opened that up because that flat wall was just rather disconcerting uh, facing East Avenue. But the lower level has some windows in it now. And when I first looked at this rendering, I thought those were steps, but those are just the tops of the, um, the, the uh, windows that are in that lower part of the, uh, the wall. Yes, that's correct. Uh, right now, those step out uh, with the sloped top to them, and we're just going to replace that. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I, I like this proposal very much. I think what you're doing is uh, really make, making a, a very nice looking building out of something that's rather drab. So I, I congratulate you on that. Okay. If no other, no other questions, Jim? Uh, Gerald Gam, questions? Um, I do have questions, and I want to say first, this is a very clear proposal. It's a very well-developed proposal. I appreciate all those aspects, and I appreciate the investment um, that you're making in the structure and in the city. Um, and I appreciate that you want to bring light into the building and call more attention to the East Avenue front of the building. So let me express my concern, and then I'll put it in the form of a question. My concern is that as the building looks now, it looks to me as a unified composition uh, where you basically have a structure. And Chris Snyder, is there a way that we can see the image of the building right now? This is what you're looking for, yeah. Gerald? Uh, yep, yeah, bottom right. Thank you. So as I look at the building right now, I see effectively these, these very angular, very square, um, almost cubes that are connected by the main entry. Uh, the one that's the, the half of it that's to our left has these tiny windows punched in. The half of it to our right has no windows punched in. It's just big blank walls. And then there's an entry in the middle, but it's a unified composition. Um, with, and I want to point this out as long as we have this photo still up, uh, with lots of plantings in front of the building to the right. Chris, can you go to the rendering of the proposed new building? So my concern here, number one, is obviously the plantings have disappeared. And so I didn't see in the proposal anything explicit about what the plants were and why they were being taken out. Um, so that was number one. So I'm wondering if you can speak to the plantings. Number two, my concern is that you've taken a building that looks like a harmonious whole and now you have two very different halves, two very dramatically different halves with these three um, boldly defined openings, one which is the main entry and the other two are these windows with these very thick white borders. And instead of having small windows, having whole walls of windows. So let me put this into the form of questions. Number one, what is the plan for plantings? Number two, how important are these white borders to your proposal? And specifically the white borders on the windows? Because part of my concern is that it is hard visually to see where the entry is where you're using the white borders everywhere. So number two, how important are the white borders? Number three, how important is it to have walls of windows rather than individual windows? 
So plantings, very thick white borders around the two windows and having walls of windows rather than individual windows. Um, for the plantings, uh, we weren't really touching those. Um, they're just not shown in the rendering. Um, try not to disturb anything that's already out there. Um, all of these are pretty located right on the face of the building. So we're not planning on having a lot of disturbance on the site um, and planning to maintain the existing sidewalks. There's a slight reconfiguration that would have to take place around that vestibule, um, but that's the extent of that. Um, for the borders around the windows, that was just the aesthetic that we were going for on that. And uh, it's prevalent throughout some other examples um, nearby. Um, and then the walls of windows, we're just trying to get as much light in there. And again, consistent with some other examples in the neighborhood of modern buildings that have large pieces of glass that are on them. So didn't think that was completely out of context. Uh, the building is very deep into the site, the length of it. Um, so I feel that this is appropriate for um, not having um, the small windows on the front and trying to invite more uh, sunlight into the front of the building. Um, okay, thank you, thank you. All right, David, David Matthews, questions for the applicant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just one question on the uh, those white borders. Would they get roof drains on the tops of them or did you have a, a plan for drainage of those? I, I know this is probably just conceptual at this point, but um, you know, the choices, are you gonna try to get drains in there or let them drip and just concerned over like long-term maintenance and, and aesthetics of, um, if you were, had taken a look at that. Sure, uh, for right now, they're just planning on the ones over the windows being drips. Uh, the one that's on the vestibule, there is a roof drain there and we'll maintain that. Okay, um, you know, as you develop the drawings, just uh, I, obviously that's a um, something to, be cognizant of and, and, and trying to maintain the, you know, long-term aesthetic of, uh, you know, your new composition. So thank you. Thanks, David. And uh, Kirsten Solberg, questions for the applicant. Um, I, I like this proposal. I know this building well. I used to walk by it all the time. So it's, it's definitely a mass. Um, so I like what you're proposing. The only area I'm struggling with a little bit, and this is just me trying to put my preservationist hat on, is when you look at this building, one of its very few redeeming architectural distinctive qualities, I'm not even going to call it redeeming, is that massive overhang at the entry. And I think to myself, well, this isn't an old building and what we're typically calling an old building. You know, it's not from 1890, but it's still a 1940s building that is part of the character of the neighborhood. And how much do we owe some integrity of the existing building? Is that cantilever important to the existing building? And, and I'm not even sure that that's the right answer, but it's going through my head. And I'm just wondering um, whether you had thought through any of that. And did you have you explored any options with keeping that cantilever or did that just not make sense? Uh, sure. So the canopy is obviously very heavy right there. Uh, mm -hmm. That was actually done as the addition in 1984. Oh. Good uh, to know. So kind of everything north of the, the part with the punched windows, if we're looking at the west elevation image there um, to the right where there's that step back in the building, uh, that was all part of an addition. So it's not original to the building. Um, mm -hmm. Not that you can tell from front to back because everything was redone with EFIS at that mm -hmm. time. Um, so yes, it's, uh, it's kind of a character to the building as it is. It's also very heavy and kind of dark as you approach the building mm -hmm. were our thoughts on that. 
Okay, I have no further questions. Just wanted to put it out there. Okay, thank you. Um, Chris Snyder, any public comments? There are no public comments for this case um, that we've received. Okay, great, thank you. Um, deliberations. Mm -hmm. So I'll just note again that um, deliberations is a closed session and uh, there's no participation by the applicants or the public. The board will be reviewing cases to take action by voting. Thank you. So we'll start with Deborah. Deborah, your thoughts on this project? I think it's a great proposal and I don't have any problems with the um, amendments or the, the new proposal at all, including the entrance and the way that entrance is echoed with the two new sets of windows. I think it's just a nice flow and it's a, it's a nice proposal and support of it. Thanks. I would agree. I think it's a huge improvement to what's there now and hopefully it will uh, attract some new tenants for you. It's, it's, I think it's a great job. Mm -hmm. Jana, Jana Crawford, your thoughts? It's, uh, well, I like it. I like it a lot. I pass by it uh, often. Uh, so um, I'm excited about um, the, um, the proposal. I support it. Thank you. Jim Devaney? Um, yeah, I, I like this. When I saw it, I could not remember this building until I actually got to the site. And then I thought, I've never noticed this building before. And I kind of like the, um, those, those white structures that outline the areas in that northern half of the building. I think they kind of brighten the building and uh, give it a little bit of a color. And, well, not so much color, but you know, just kind of put a little life into uh, those walls that seem quite drab in the, uh, the original design. So I, I, I like this very much and I'm prepared to support it. Thank you. Uh, Gerald Gam. I obviously have had reservations about the redesign, but I also have a lot of respect for my colleagues on this board. And if the rest of you feel like this is a sympathetic um, adaptation of the existing building, I, I would not oppose it. I, I would favor removing the white borders from the two windows so that the entryway was clearly articulated. And I worry that there's some ambiguity about how you enter the building with this new plan. But if the rest of you see this as in keeping with architecture in the neighborhood and architecture in the rest of the building, this is not one that I would strongly oppose, but I'm obviously not enthusiastic about it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dave Matthews. Yeah, I, uh, I agree with the direction of, of the proposal. I think, um, you know, taking something that, like Jim says, you barely notice, and I've driven by it almost, you know, three or four times a week for a couple of years, and, and you know, giving it some character and, and obviously the natural light to, to provide the spaces on the inside with, um, with more viable um, solutions for offices, I think, uh, you know, anything to, to help out the streetscape of East Avenue um, and make this building a little bit more prominent is a good thing. Um, and preserving more of the neighborhood rather than seeing a, a building that might be, uh, you know, vacant um, versus alive with, with uh, occupants. So I think that, you know, from that standpoint, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, a very viable um, proposal, and and I'm I'm agreement in, in agreement with the uh, with the direction of this. Thank you, and Kirsten Solberg. Um, I agree with most of what's been said. I think it's breathing new life into this building. Um, I think again the precedents are very helpful in that this type of frame architecture has become somewhat consistent with. Uh, renovating some of these more modern buildings along East Avenue. Uh, you definitely can start to see a trend and a pattern there. So I think it's in keeping with what has been allowed um, along East Ave. Um, that would be my only comment. Otherwise I would approve it. Okay, great, thank you. 
Um, I guess, Mr. Davini, would you like to give me a motion? Respect to um, case number five, file number A 026 20 21. Um, the proposal to, I suggest that we approve the proposal to install windows on a portico at the main entryway vestibule and to install windows on the north and east facades of this existing office building as outlined in this proposal. Second. Thank you. Motion has been made by James Davini and properly seconded by Deborah Beardsley. We will now, I will go through alphabetically and we will, I will call it a vote. So we'll start with Deborah Beardsley. I voted in favor, uh, yay for this application. Deborah Beardsley votes yay for this motion. I'm next, Christopher Coretta. I vote yay for this motion. Kajana Crawford. I vote yay. Kajana Crawford votes yay for this motion. Jim Davini. Vote yay. Jim Davini votes yay for the motion. Gerald Gam. Respecting the aesthetic uh, judgment of my colleagues, I vote yay. Gerald Gam votes yay for this. And David Matthews. I vote yay. David Matthews votes yay for this motion. Kirsten Solberg. Yay. Kirsten Solberg votes yay. And it is unanimous. Thank you very much for the application. And we will close this case and move on to the next. Thank you for your time. Okay. The next case is uh, case six, file A-027-20-21 for a certificate of appropriateness. Uh, the applicants are Mary Scipioni, the project consultant and David Norbit, the property owner. And the addresses involved are 1240 East Avenue and 324 Culver Road. The project is to install a four foot tall wrought iron perimeter fence with a gate and to propose landscaping changes to these premises. All board members have visited this site. Thank you very much, Mr. Snyder. Mary Scipioni, are you with us? Yes, it's Scipioni, thank you. Scipioni, I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right. Like prosciutto. <laughs> I should know that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. As uh, Chris has uh, mentioned. I just, have to, I just have to swear you in. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. That's okay. Uh, do you, Mary Scipioni, solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. We're ready for, we're ready for your presentation. All righty. So I am going to be talking about the wrought iron perimeter fence on 1240 East Avenue and the associated plantings uh, for this application. Um, a little bit of history, at, in 2017, I presented a kind of a master plan for this property that included the fencing and the 48 inch fencing and some plantings. And that was approved on condition that uh, a planting list was presented for the plants and that a design was presented for the fence. Uh, we weren't able to move fast enough on that project. So in 2019, I came back to the preservation board with a plan, a partial uh, plant list for some plants that were planted, um, Arborvitae 11, Arborvitae on the east side of the property between 1240 and 1250. Uh, three rhododendrons uh, planted uh, where the 324 Culver meets 1240 East. And I had proposed six uh, European horn beams along the Culver Road side with a substitute uh, of uh, 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 maples, which are, they're called Acer Fremani. They're a cross between silver maples and red maples. Um, the board asked me to only plant, uh, use four plants on that side so that the corner would still be uh, visually accessible. So we uh, actually installed four of the maples there. Um, so that's where we are now. So now I'm back to 
uh, talk about the fence again, and which was previously considered appropriate uh, pending approval of the design. And um, also we would like to add some additional plantings. Now, the reason why this fence is so important to this property, are, are, there's more than one reason. The first one is this is a corner lot on a busy intersection. And while we are using a fence that would preserve the visual access into the property, which I, we all agree is important, um, corner lots have particular conditions. Uh, there are a lot of people were traipsing across this property diagonally. And um, even we put in this planting, I'm sorry, I, didn't, I for, forgot to mention, we also put in the privet hedge, which was part of the 2019 uh, planting proposal. And that is a very successful addition to the property. And I've received calls from people I don't even know, as has Mr. Norbert, about what an improvement that was for this property. Uh, the corner lots on these blocks are a little bit like the reinforced toe of a boot. It needs to be a little more substantial in terms of the edge or the property and the intersection tend to leak into each other visually. And this way it, it gives a little bit of a bookend to the, to the block. Um, in addition to that, there's a safety issue. Um, Mr. Norbert has a small and growing family um, and it's dangerous for the children to not have an enclosure on this yard. And I, I, um, I'm a big fan of historic Rochester. And to me, this street uh, means that Rochester is a beautiful city, essentially. And um, I, I want that to be preserved. Um, but I also think it's really important. Another thing that has to be preserved in this district is diversity and social equity. And I don't think that we should have uh, prejudices against families living in the Historic Preservation District. And that means taking into consideration things like safety of children. Um, that said, this fence is not, does not diverge from the neighboring properties. In fact, if you look at the photos that were included, um, you'll see that the, um, property on the northwest corner of Culver and East has a, a pretty substantial fence um, that is actually between 58 and 61 inches high with corner details that go up to 72 inches high. Um, I think it looks pretty sturdy there on the corner and it's very important because that way that property gets the that owner gets to own his whole property rather than having it cut off at the corners. Um, I noticed that there was a misconception in the description on the, the summary of this application that said that the posts of the fence that we're proposing were 60 inches high and that's not the case, um, nor is the height of the gate 64 inches high. Um, that was an easy thing to mistake because on the second page of the um, November 10th letter that indicates product details for wrought iron fence, there is an image of the neighbor's fence at 1250, which is set back a little bit. And it shows that there are um, brick piers and a gate, which is 60 inches high. And um, so um, essentially, I think that was mixed up with the one we're proposing. and. Um, I can understand that this has been a long and complicated process. So yes, we have precedents in the neighboring um, properties. And yes, we have already um, gotten a, a approval of a fence uh, in concept. And I have three exhibits, A, B, and C, showing it's a simple uh, wrought iron fence with uh, pickets and a top rail and a bottom rail. Um, exhibit B shows what a post looks like, there, there are, um, every section has a post with a ball cap on it. Now, to just to be, to dot my I's and cross my T's, I made sure that it was clear that those ball caps do exceed four, 48 inches because that is what all fences do. Uh, it's just a, a four inches every eight feet on a three by three post. So it's 
it's insignificant uh, given there's 450 feet of, of fence here. Um, the gate um, has a curved silhouette because the pickets are graduated. You can see that in um, exhibit C. And it was suggested that there would be an area of variance required for this. But again, I calculated exactly how much area the pickets occupy in the gate and how much the graduated pickets change that area as they go up. And I determined that for the gate alone, there is an overall increase of 3.6 inches or 6.6% of the area of the gate, which is a very small part of the entire fence. Um, it's the only gate that is in the fence. I just wanted to clarify that because sometimes these are sticky little issues. And I know with fences, it's very important to know every last detail because there are a lot of poorly manufactured fences out there. And I know the intention of the board is to maintain a certain level of quality here. Um, when we say wrought iron fence nowadays, we're talking of essentially about uh, steel, black steel fences. It's not exactly the same as the wrought iron fences that were made uh, many years ago, but it is definitely not an aluminum powder coated fence, which are many of the fences that you see also including in this neighborhood, which I've also included an example um, in my uh, character photos. There is a fence on Culver that um, is between, there you go right there. Um, so it's not, um, <clears throat> we're trying to use the best uh, possible material currently available. So as far as the planting goes, I'll be brief. Um, if you can show the planting plan, Chris, thank you. Um, we have only three groups of plants that are very darker than the others. Um, and when you approve the planting um, in, in concept in 2017, I suggested that we might need to have backup species for some of the plants because you might not find uh, them available uh, in the season that you're actually planting. And the board asked me to indicate two or three choices per plant. So on the planting list here, I've done so. And so I've indicated a first choice there on the drawing, but I have what I consider a list of plants that are uh, visually interchangeable in terms of mass, texture, and uh, quality and uh, appropriateness to, to Rochester to the type of plants you would find in Highland Park or along East Avenue. And they include summer sweet or clethra, uh, yellow or red twig dogwood, hydrangea, oak leaf hydrangea, and various viburnum species, which are uh, a very classic selection of, of shrubs. Now, all of these shrubs can be uh, exceed 48 inches. They can be kept at 48 inches. I know I didn't need to ask for the permission for the appropriateness for the 48 inch ones. Um, we did want to be thorough and um, some of these might exceed that height by a little bit um, depending on uh, the species, but that's what we're aiming for. We're basically trying to block um, the headlight intrusion into the property from the corners, especially from Culver Road going north. And I think that's all I need to say. I, I, I think it's better at this point and in the interest of saving time to refer to you and, and see if you have any questions that I can answer based on the material that I've already submitted. Okay, well, thank you for the um, presentation. We will go uh, alphabetically down through the members and see if they have any questions for you. Uh, we'll start with Kirsten Solberg. Any questions for the applicant? Well, thank you for a, a very well put together proposal. Um, I think it's very clear what the intent is. Um, my only question, and again, looking at the precedents that you provided, was there any consideration for masonry piers at some, uh, for example, at the gate locations, when you go down East Ave, that seems to be a reoccurring theme. Was that thought through or what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, the house is rather neoclassical in character and doesn't really mm -hmm. feature a lot of brick. And also yeah. it's, it's um, we have a, a, a hedge there and the mm -hmm. fence will be outside of this hedge. And so it 
didn't really seem appropriate to me or to Mr. Norger. In addition, it would add a considerable cost to the project. We're, we're doing 450 linear feet of wrought iron fencing here. And this is why this has been delayed and created so many problems because um, uh, it is a considerable expense. And then I guess I have one more additional question. The other significant fence that you see on East Avenue is at um, the Strath Allen and they have a three foot fence. What are your thoughts? Um, I, part of me thinks a three foot fence is better because it's less fence, but then I wonder if a more substantial looking fence just feels better with the space. Well, a four foot fence is allowed. And um, mm -hmm. I think for the protection of the children, it's better. Um, there are a lot of people in this neighborhood, if you, if you were a resident here, you would know that sleep on people's properties. And, you know, unfortunately we have homeless population in the city and, and um, people uh, have already made incursions into the property damaging this hedge that has been uh, uh, installed. And so we're hoping that we can protect the property's integrity by having this fence. And if it's too easy to get over, um, I, I, I don't think it's going to be a, an investment that falls short of its objective. Does that answer your okay. question, Karsten? It does. I just wanted to everything that I'm thinking. But thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kirsten. <clears throat> Dave Matthews, any questions? I do not um, have any questions. Mary, thank you for the proposal. Thank you, Dave. Gerald Gam, any questions for Mary? Um, I have a couple of questions. I like the proposal for the fence very much. And as, as you pointed out in response to Kirsten's question, my understanding too is you have the right to put up a four foot fence and that seems appropriate. Um, so my questions, I think most of them are quick. You just alluded to the fact the fence is going on the outside of the hedge, not the inside of the hedge. Is that correct? Yes, that's the typical behavior. No, no, and that is typical, but it wasn't obvious from the drawings. So I just wanted to double check. So the fence oh, is I'm sorry. I apologize for that. It, it, yes, it's the, uh, the downfall of the eight and a half by 11 format. Right, but okay, but the fence, so the fence is going on the outside of the hedge. The hedge is inside the yard. The fence yes. is on the exterior. Okay, that's number one. Number two, um, I wanna talk about the gate and there are a number of bushes there. And I noticed in the proposal, it mentions that two of the bushes are going to come out to make room for the gate. Um, is taking out two bushes enough? Well, um, there, I believe they will be enough because the gate is four feet. We may have to prune the adjacent ones, but there are 175 privets in this hedge and it's you know, it's possible that we may need to remove three. The, the point is we're keeping the gate as small as possible so that we can, um, I mean, I, we don't expect that pedestrians will be entering the property this way. It's more to adhere to a certain style of presentation on East Avenue. You know, and I appreciate that. We live a few blocks away and I love the idea that visually there's going to be a gate there where you can see even for four feet wide, see into the yard, Personally, I have no objection if you need to take out three bushes or even four. I like the idea that there's going to be a visual opening into the yard. Um, so my next question is, visually, uh, I assume the gate is going to go dead center. And you mentioned somewhere in the proposal that it, visually it's going to form a line with the front door of the house. Problem is a few feet into the yard is an enormous tree. Right That's in the right. Line. So has any thought been given to placing the gate off to the left or off to the right? So visually you can see the front door of the house instead of just looking into a tree? Well, um, Gerald, that's, that's a very good question. And this is the downfall of a plan drawing because it looks like the tree is this big ball that's blocking your view. In, in reality, um, you can see to the front door, uh, that's, that's the intention and, um, the trunk of the tree is out of the way of the gate. This property has an asymmetrical planting on it because it was very organically done and it's been there for a long time. So what we're trying to do is superimpose a symmetrical layout on an asymmetrical plan. And I think the two can work together. That's my opinion as a designer. Um, I'm a landscape architect, by the way. I don't know if I told you that. Um, so I guess to follow up on my 
question as I look at the drawing, because the funny thing is, I noticed the trunk not from the drawing. I noticed it from standing there on the sidewalk and walked into the gate area, looked straight ahead to the house. And what's right in front of me is, is this big tree. As I look at the drawing, would it make any sense to move the gate area, which means obviously transplanting a whole bunch of bushes, but move it closer to Culver Road to get away from that tree? So visually, as you enter the yard, you're not staring into a tree. Would that make any sense? I understand what you're saying, and you have a good point. And I'm sure that the board wouldn't have wanted me to propose removing that gigantic basswood. Um, so um, I, I don't think that I would want it off center in that little niche area because we were thinking down the road, maybe we would plant that area a little bit. And so it would be kind of like the boutonniere of the, the jacket on the street. Um, putting the gate over on the other side there is already a gate, um, which is the, the, um, the vehicle Mary, I entrance apologize. property. I, I apologize for interrupting. The question I ask is basically that little inset right now that says gate. Oh, located. yes. You're saying off center pushing, there. Pushing, pushing that seven or eight feet. So it's still on East Avenue, but it's closer to Culver, which would mean transplanting all those bushes. You know, we'll probably have to make some sort of minimal adjustment with that gate also because of the fence sections. So it would be nice to have a little bit of latitude on that, but I'd be happy to consider um, if, if the board agree, everyone on the board agrees that moving that gate so that it doesn't uh, visually intercept the tree at all um, is more important than having it lined up with the door. Uh, the front entry of the house, then, you know, I, I think that we can compromise on that. And can I just Thank clarify? I'm sorry for interrupting, guys. Um, we're talking about this linden tree here? Yes. Okay, just making sure. I think you said basswood or something, Mary. I wanted to make it's sure there just wasn't an, another, it, it, it's, just it's, another term. Okay. Yeah, it's another term for the same tree. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. no, that's fine. And my only other question is, based on the project description, it says that the property has a number of large trees, all of which will be preserved as long as they're healthy and viable. You do understand, and I'm pretty sure you do, that ultimately you need to come to Chris's office or to the preservation board to remove a tree, that that can't just be a decision made by the homeowner to remove a tree based on health or viability. We understand that. Okay, just wanted to check. Mm -hmm. Anyways, thank you for the proposal. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Gerald. Um, next would be Jim Devinney. Any questions for Mary? No, I don't have any questions at this time. It's been an interesting conversation. Thank you. Kajana, Kajana Crawford, any questions for Mary? No, I don't have any questions, but I had the same question that Jara had about the uh, uh, gate, but it's been answered, so. Great, mm -hmm. thank you. I have no questions, Deborah Beardsley. I don't have any new questions that haven't already been asked. Okay. Um, if the board members have no further questions, we'll ask Chris Snyder to read any public testimony if we have any. We do not have any public testimony for this case. Um, give me one second. I'm just gonna turn this around for us Get to the end here. Yeah, there was no public uh, testimony provided for this month's case uh, for this item. Um, so we'll just go right to the deliberations then. Uh, and I just wanna remind for anyone in the public who's watching and who's just joined us um, that deliberations are closed, uh, sessions and reviews of the cases and voting by the board, um, applicants in the public uh, do not um, participate. Okay. Thanks, Chris. So we'll start with uh, Kirsten. Kirsten, what are your thoughts on this project? I feel good about it and would uh, support it. The way it sits? The way it sits. Okay. David Matthews? <clears throat> yeah, I agree. I, you know, it's been a number of years since uh, this whole thing has been developed, but it looks like it's finally coming into, um, you know, uh, 
a point where the original visions or, or thoughts um, are are coming to fruition. So, uh, um, yeah, I, I'm I'm in agreement with the with the proposal as it stands. Great, thank you, Gerald. So. I support the proposal as it stands. I'd have no trouble voting for it as it stands, but I would want to give um, the applicant the flexibility to move that entire keyhole area several feet to the west so that they could then have a gate that opened up into the yard instead of opening up visually into a big tree. So I would support it as it stands, but I would favor giving them the flexibility to move it, to move those bushes should they wish to. Gotcha. Thank you. Jim Devaney. Uh, no, actually, I, I like this proposal. I was fascinated by all the different considerations that went into doing this layout and the, the mention of headlight intrusion just really caught my attention. I thought all the things you have to think about doing this. So I think it's a very well thought through uh, proposal and I'm ready to support it. Thank you. Kajana Crawford, your thoughts on this? Uh, my thoughts are is a, a very good proposal. Um, I think it should move forward. Great, as is. Um, I feel the same. I think it's a very well done, well thought of project. I like the materials of the uh, fence. I'm okay with the focal point being on the front door. I think it adds a little bit of interest with the tree there. It's not that type of property. Um, the asymmetry is, is fine with me. I think it works. Um, Deborah? I am in support of this application. I think it's very thorough and very appropriate for the neighborhood. Great. Um, Dave Matthews, would you like to give me a motion, unless Gerald would like to give us a motion to add that twist to it? to see how people feel about it. Okay, and so I will add the twist and I just wanna clarify my twist is just an option for the homeowners, not something that we would require. Right. So let me offer it and see if there's objection. Um, it's file number 8-027-20-21 um, at 1240 East Avenue and 324 Culver Road to install a four foot, four foot tall wrought iron perimeter fence with a taller gate and to modify landscaping to these premises that we accept the proposal as offered and we give the homeowner additional flexibility should they wish to relocate the keyhole area and gate a few feet west on East Avenue, they have that flexibility. Second. Okay, a motion has been made by Gerald Gam and properly seconded by Kajana Crawford. We will take a vote. We'll start, we'll do it alphabetically and we'll start with Deborah Beardsley. I'm in support of this application. I vote yay. You vote yay for the motion. Uh, next would be me, Christopher Coretta. I vote yay for the motion. Kijana Crawford. I vote yay. Kijana Crawford votes yay for the motion. Jim Devinney. I vote yay. Jim Devinney votes yay for the motion. Gerald Gam. I vote yay. Gerald Gamboche for the motion. David Matthews. I vote yay. David Matthews votes yay for the motion. And Kirsten Solberg? Yay. Kirsten Solberg is yay for the motion, which is unanimous. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, with that, we will close this case and Chris Snyder will move us on to the next case. Okay, so the next case is for 324 Culver Road. Um, this is a case for a certificate of appropriateness. Um, file A-0, oh, and this was a, the case that was held from the November 4th, 2020 hearing. The applicant has amended this application to add an additional uh, patio portion to the project. It was originally just the shed application. Um, the file number is A-021-20-21. Applicant is Mary Scipioni, the project uh, landscape architect, and uh, David Norbert, the property owner, um, for 324 Culver Road to legalize the installation of a 10 foot by 16 foot accessory shed structure at the rear yard of this single family dwelling and to remove an existing patio and landscape area in the rear yard to install uh, a new 570 foot 
square foot bluestone patio, including a fountain and a landscape area in its place. All board members have visited this site. Thank you, Chris. Um, Mary, you're with us. I have to swear you in again. Do you, Mary Shipioni, solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this hearing is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And, and hello again. Hello again. We're ready for your next, <laughs> your next uh, project. Um, all right, the shed. Um, this shed was obviously uh, installed without a, a, a permit. Um, there are photographs of this shed, uh, and I'm going to read the description of, of the shed. Um, if you might, you might want to consult the, um, the photos to get an idea of what it looks like. I'm sorry, I just lost my page with the description written on it. Take time. Okay, here we go. Okay, so the shed is there for housing children's bicycles and so on and so forth. And I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to uh, make any excuse for the, the circumstances under which this was done. It was last March and we all know what was going on uh, last March and April. And um, there was also on top of the pandemic arriving without a proper announcement, um, work was being done on Sager Street and the garage was practically inaccessible because the garage for this property opens onto Sager Street. Um, Mr. Norbert says he contacted someone at the city. I, I don't know the details of that and I don't wanna belabor that issue. The fact is the shed is there now and it's a 16 by 10 foot shed it's a custom, custom variant of sheds manufactured uh, by Amish Outlet of North Chile. It was designed to be consistent with the style of the house. It's a wood structure finished with wood siding painted white. The roof is a charcoal gray architectural shingle. The roof ridge has a vented cupola with a weather vane. The shed has double doors facing the asphalt drive in the house, symmetrically flanked by windows. The door opening is five feet, two inches, and the windows are 18 inches wide. Both doors and windows have four inch white trim. The double door and the door window shutters are black. So it's pretty fancy shed, I guess you could say. Um, well, in keeping with the style of the house. And so it exceeds the square footage by a small amount. And uh, Chris, I'm sorry, I don't know what the maximum, legal maximum is. Um, but then I, I need to talk to you about the patio. So if you could, so we could, if we could put the shed on hold for a second on the back burner. Um, if you go to the photograph of the existing conditions on the patio, it, that way you can understand where it's going. There, that was it. Oh, oh, the, these existing. Okay. I, I'm there. The one with the brick paving, yes. Okay. So currently, um, there we go. Can that be rotated? Oh, excellent. Um, you're looking at the, the house, you're looking north in the lower right um, image. And that is an, an addition that, that um, is to the house. It's, it's an, kind of like a sunroom, but the real sunroom, I mean, the, pre, the prior sunroom is on your left as you're looking forward there. So this patio area kind of wraps around like an L uh, to provide access from the, the circle where uh, the turnaround is for the drive. And um, right now it's currently in poor condition. It's a combination of traditional brick and concrete pavers and there's, there's poor drainage and so on and so forth. So the purpose of this patio is to get this uh, material out of there and replace it with some natural stone. So this patio will be, um, and I guess we can look at um, the drawing of the, the, there are two drawings of the project, the design. One is focused on stonework. So if we can look at that one first, Chris, please.
I'm sorry, which one are you looking at? The, the stonework that's going to be proposed? This is this yeah, that, you're there for? you go. Okay. There you go. Okay, so what, what we've done with this is we've kept the basic footprint of the existing patio, except now there's a fountain going into it, which occupies about 90 square feet. So we are expanding the square footage uh, a little bit, but I think it's, it's still within uh, the allowable for the, for the lot. Um, what we have done is in front of the sunroom, which is on your left where the double doors are going inward. Um, yes, we've expanded the stone area in front of that so that it goes across the entire front, whereas before it just went up to the door. So that last uh, few feet of stonework on the left of the drawing to the left of the doors is additional square footage as opposed to what was there prior. Um, this is basically a simple rectangular layout except for the path which curves in and the curve that goes around the fountain because it's a circular fountain. Now um, I've designed a stone table to, to be, which will be permanently located um, in line with the entrance to the residence. And that will be in turn lined up with the fountain. And around the fountain, we're going to cut the stone in an orange wedge pattern. And all the detailing around the, the blue stone is going to be granite. Uh, granite bricks, so they're four by four by nine. Those will also be laid flat uh, around the structure where there are no steps. Uh, you can see the gray, it looks like a gray, a three or four gray dashed lines following the perimeter of the house. That is the same granite that will be used to detail around the fountain, and it's the same granite that will be used to edge the planting bed. Now we're also going to be um, doing some planting uh, where currently there is just a large scale crushed stone. It's kind of like a, sto a white stone mulch um, it, where you see the brown now, um, which is representing the planted area. Um, we're actually going to be improving the perviousness of that area and the, um, the um, kind of the environmental performance, I guess you could say of that area which I think more than compensates for a small increase in, in the square footage of the stone. Um, if we can look at the planting. Oh, that's the table. Um, yeah, that's the table. It has five legs because you can't cantilever a solid slab of stone that's seven and a half by three and a half feet very far. So we're trying to keep the cantilever to about 12 inches, which is which is uh, sufficient. This will be like two and a half inches thick. Um, okay, so that's the table and that will be embedded in the ground. That's the fountain. The color will match the stone. It's, it's, it's a French gray, it's called. It, it's the closest they have to the blue stone. Um, this fountain does not spray upward. It just, it spills over. So it's not going to be throwing a six foot jet up into the air or anything like that. And it's made out of um, cast stone, which is essentially reconstituted stone. It's not concrete. It's actual stone material, um, but it's cast. And there's the French gray color. Thanks, Chris. And then if you look at the planting, you now you can see the whole thing in a little bit zoomed out. Um, that planted area, which was just a bunch of pots laying on, um, this crushed stone is now going to be soil and it's going to be mounted up just 30 inches enough to create some uh, psychological separation between the area where the vehicles are and where the gathering space is, is going to be. And basically what we've done there is we've placed the, the small tree that you see in the lower right of the, of the planted area is a red bud and it's just about lined up with the gate on Culver. So when you drive past the property in the spring, you'll see the profusion of flowers on, on that small tree. And, um, and then the plants go down in size as they, as they descend. It's kind of like a reverse amphitheater uh, layout. And I have a planting list there. So if you have any questions about the individual plants, Basically, we've tried to get a variety of uh, seasonal interest, fragrance, uh, winter interest, fall color, 
And these are all pretty standard, uh, high quality species, which I think will uh, add a lot of quality to the space and soften and complement stonework. And I think I've said enough. Um, I think it's best if you ask me, uh, direct your questions to me so I'll know exactly what you need to know further. There's also a stone bench, uh, a custom stone bench in this plan. It's kind of a curved shape to follow the shape of the fountain. Sorry, I, those are other projects that I've done which use that blue stone and granite combination. Okay, thank you, Mary. Um, we'll open up the questions. We will start with Deborah. Deborah, any questions for Mary? I don't think so. This is very thorough and I'm really enjoying uh, the renderings as well as the planting descriptions as well as um, additional description that Mary has added in. And I'm, if I had one question, it's just about the patterning of the blue stone, the paving um, for the patio. And I, I'm seeing kind of an indicated pattern there, but I, I'm imagining it's, it's sort of indicated. And I, I just wondered what is there, um, is it, very random, Mary, the, the no, uh, sizes. Uh, thank you, Deborah, um, for the question. I just did a very illustrative indication of grout lines, or there's not even any grouting. These are budded. Uh, uh, each row, um, these, the, the pattern is typically based on using um, different sized, three or four different sized uh, pieces. Uh, they could be 18 by 24, uh, 24 by 36. Uh, 18 by 18, and then they're placed next to each other in a row, and then you do the next row. So it's not going to be super funky pattern. It's going to be pretty regular, but using the different formats allows you to adapt the stone to the particular space without creating obvious and unsightly cutting of the stone that looks like it doesn't work. So, right. Okay. That's and what then I of course we'll approach you. that fountain, and that will be like a separate kind of cutout area. Right. Got it. Um, so, just to recap, really briefly, to be sure that I understood what you just said, it would <clears throat> there would not be a wild assortment of different sizes and proportions. There would be perhaps three. Uh, proportions that all interrelate as a system and then yeah. however it's laid down everything will will coordinate with one another yes yeah, so we have to maintain some flexibility in how those are laid but um, I'm working with someone who I've done many projects with all over the Finger Lakes and I only work with qualified stone masons great thank you thanks Deborah um, I have one only question I have is really about the shed. Uh, is the purpose of the shed uh, to, uh, for anything visual, is it just for storage? Is it a design for a specific design idea? Uh, it's for storage. And here's the thing, this property, again, I mentioned it was vulnerable at the corner of Culver and East. It's also vulnerable in the back because the, the garage goes out onto Sager Street. So the children's toys, they're, they're outdoor toys, like, you know, it could be a small pool, it could be, you know, a riding, uh, you know, bicycles, things like that. Um, and so it is used for storage, but to go out into the garage and then have to go in through the, the gate, electric gate and back into the backyard, obviously the children can't do that safely. So it's essentially for storing toys and some lawn uh, accessories that, that are there because of the, of the children. So it was kind of urgent and um, at least Mr. Norbert felt that way. And um, so the shed is, has plenty of stuff in it. It's not just a decoration, no. Okay. I hope that answers your question. It Chris. does. Thank you. I don't have any other questions right now. Kajana Crawford, any questions? No, I don't have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jim Devinney? I don't have any questions. Thank you, James. And Gerald Gam? 
Um, so I have a couple of questions. I, I just want to begin by saying how impressed I am with this planting plan and the planting plan in the preceding uh, case. This is an incredibly well thought through uh, set of plantings and pavings and just organization of the yard. And I'm just really impressed with the materials being used, the fence in the last proposal, the bluestone. Um, and in general, I'm just really, really impressed by all of this. My question, like Chris's, is about the shed. Um, and it's, it's obviously challenging to talk about the shed because it's already there. But my reaction when I saw the shed was that this is a well-designed shed. Uh, it's using, as far as I can tell, the right materials. It's wood siding that's painted. Uh, the roof has uh, architectural shingles that match the shingles on the house. Uh, but I have a couple of questions about the shed. One is, what are the windows? Are these vinyl windows? Are these wood windows? What is the material used for the windows? It's, uh, it's the structure is in wood. Um, oh, you're uh, here. The front window's there. Oh, I'm going to have to pull something up to. I don't want. I I wrote down that everything was in wood. Let me just check my description that I wrote. Yeah, because I couldn't find it in the proposal. Yeah, I, I mean, I suppose they could they could be vinyl windows, but I'd have to verify that. I'm sorry. Okay, so that. My only questions, I have no questions at all about the plantings, no questions about the layout of the yard. My only questions are about the shed. So one question is, before I feel comfortable approving the shed, number one, we need to know more about the materials and especially the materials for the windows, because there's some windows that we would approve for the district and some we wouldn't, and we would not approve vinyl windows. And there was no way to see the windows from East Avenue. My second concern with the shed is its orientation. If we look at it from the view that we're seeing on the screen right now, the shed is incredibly attractive. You have these two windows with shutters with, with a large door in the middle. That's a very attractive view of the shed, but that's not the view you see from East Avenue. And if you think of East Avenue as the, the, the front of the front yard of this yard, what you're seeing instead is the rear of a building that's blocking the house. And so, if we were given guidance before the shed had been built, I would argue that the shed's orientation should shift so that the more interesting faces of the shed face the street rather than head its back to the street. Given that the shed is already there, the question I have in addition to the material being used for the windows is, is there any reason it would not be feasible to add windows with shutters to the rear of the shed as well? Could that be done? It's now just an uninterrupted blank wall. So is there any structural reason that one or two windows couldn't be added to the rear? Gerald, when you say the rear, which side of the shed do you mean? In I mean, oh, I mean, as we're, as, as we're standing on East Avenue. Over here. Yep, and walking into the keyhole area where the gate is, and you looked, yeah, so as you this look side from- wall. Yeah, as you look from the south. The south the side. Yeah, the side Avenue. wall. The wall, the wall of the shed that's parallel to East Avenue and that faces East Avenue. Which is which is a blank wall and blocks the house. So the question I'm asking is whether that side of the shed parallel to East Avenue, facing East Avenue, is there any structural reason that there couldn't be one or two windows cut into that wall? All right, well, I'll try to address it. First of all, I apologize for not being 100% certain about the window trim. Um, I know that uh, I was told there's nothing, this is not, there's nothing vinyl on this structure. And I think that I, I as since I swore to tell the whole truth, I'm assuming that that's the case, uh, but it could be that that was just referring to the siding and the framing and the windows might be uh, off the shelf. I wouldn't, I didn't notice that they were made of, uh, that they were vinyl. Now that, so we don't know. We don't know that answer, okay? I don't know that answer. I apologize for that. Um, as far as the back goes or the front, 
One of the problems and the challenges with this property is that everything is a front and a back at the same time. And it's, it's very difficult to get everything to satisfy from every direction. The reason the door is facing the house is because that's where the children come and go to get their stuff. And the reason there aren't windows all the way around for functional purposes is because you have shelves in there that's, that are used to store things on. So like in a house, you, if you have windows everywhere, you have no place to put your furniture. So that is a problem. Now, that doesn't mean that we couldn't plant back there or something like that if you wanted the back of the structure to be softened. And I did suggest that to Dave, but then we thought this was gonna open a whole new can of worms with the preservation board in terms of getting you know, a planting plan and so on and so forth. But if you were to make that a condition, for example, I think we can get plants in there on the Culver Road property without going over the border onto 1240 East. So. That's one thing I could throw out there to you. Uh, I did show some images from East Avenue and it's very hard to see this shed, uh, that blank side that you're referring to. I, I didn't try to avoid taking a photograph of that. There is one that does show it and it looks very tiny from, from the road there. If you so Mary, 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 we can debate how visible it is from East Avenue. I will just tell you, standing there from East Avenue, I see the back of a small shed sitting in front of the house. So my yeah. only question is, structurally, would it be possible? You're pointing out there might be shelves there, but it sounds like structurally, if, if we required it, it might be possible to put a window or two in. Well, I don't know. That might be a bit complicated. And I don't know how reasonable it would be because it would the point of having the shed the size it is, is to hold a certain amount of material that would be compromised by adding the windows on that side. However, you know, I, I think it would be probably a better solution if we could find a, another way to resolve that issue rather than impacting the structure and compromising the function of the structure. But that's just my opinion. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dave Matthews, any questions for Mary? Um, Mary, is the shed permanent? Does it have a foundation in it? Um, it's set on a, it's set on a crushed, four inch crushed stone base. So it's basically, um, it's in a permanent, what they consider to be a permanent, uh, position. Permanent position, but it could be pulled out and, you know, move somewhere else in, you know, in, in theory, right? In theory, it could. I, I'd like to, you know, I, I looked at this myself because I wasn't involved in, in the project of the shed in any way. Um, when I saw it there, I was wondering about the position. And I think the decision to put it where it was, was actually the correct one, given that there's so little um, usable space on the 324 property um, to put something like that. Yeah. So okay. I, I think it, I think there really isn't another alternative there. If you're, if you're suggesting that the angle be changed, we have the problem of going over the pro the, there is a property line there between 324 and, and 1240, even though Mr. Norbert owns both parcels. So that, so to answer your question, I, I think it's where it needs to be. Uh, you might have a different opinion about that. Um, I think if you went there and, 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 and studied it, you'd probably come to the same conclusion. Yeah, no, I mean, well, I don't, you know, from from the standpoint of the house and, and your patio and everything, it that makes sense. Um, but it's not permanently attached into the ground. It's not built from foundation. No, know, no, no, there are no footings. Okay, okay. Well, I mean, you know, that's the thing about needing to approve things that weren't, didn't get reviewed as, you know, we don't know all the information. So um, I guess just for the record, we have a much easier time reacting to things that are proposed rather than trying to react to things that are already there, um, you know, in general. And um, I like it. I like the shed. I like, you know, the configuration of it. I think Gerald's concerns are valid. Um, it's not permanent though. It could be moved or altered if um, that was desired. Um, so just, uh, it was just my question. That's all. Thank you. 
I appreciate what you're saying, Chris. And um, I think part of the reason that I'm here now trying to uh, come before you and present uh, the projects that Mr. Norbert has in mind is so that we can uh, work together and try to come up with the best solutions. So it's my intention to make that happen with you guys. And yep. I, I really appreciate your comments. And I have to say that Gerald, for not being an architect, uh, you have a very astute eye. I've listened to your comments on the other projects as well. And um, I'm pretty impressed with that. Uh, thank you. Hey. Okay, Mary, thank you. Um, Kirsten? I don't have any um, questions. I think that the uh, landscape was very well presented. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, do we have, Chris Snyder, do we have any public comments on this particular case? There are no public comments that have been submitted for uh, in reaction to this project. Um, so we will just go straight into deliberations. And I will just note again, um, deliberations are closed to applicants and the public uh, and are where the board will take action by voting. Thank you, Chris. Okay, let's start with Deborah. Deborah, what are your thoughts? Hi, I think the proposal is high quality. I think some very good points have come up about the garden, or I'm sorry, the accessory shed. And I'll be interested to hear my colleagues further comments on that. I'm glad that if it needs to or wants to be rotated or moved to another location, perhaps that offers something. But I, in general, I think it's, it's a good proposal overall. Thanks, Deborah. Um, I like the plantings very much. I like the blue stone patio. I think that's a great design. I think it works well with the rest of the building and the neighborhood. I don't, unfortunately, think that the shed is appropriate. I don't think that's what I didn't hear you. I didn't hear you. You went down. I'm sorry. I, I don't think that the shed is appropriate. Um, it really ca caught my eye, um, especially from the East Avenue side. I don't even think that windows would really help it all that much, just my personal opinion or, or plantings really, but I just don't think it's appropriate where it is. It feels like it was just kind of thrown on the property. Uh, it completely changes the whole feel of the property. Um, but those are just my opinions. That's just my opinion and my thought. Kajana, what are your thoughts? Uh, my thoughts um, are similar to yours. I, I like the, uh, I don't have any problems with uh, a shed. Uh, it's the location, uh, but um, uh, the plannings are, are well thought out. Um, I'm, I'm willing to listen to my colleagues, um, but I think that this is, um, the consequence of uh, moving without uh, input or um, permission uh, after the fact. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jim Devaney. Uh, generally, I like what I'm seeing here. I certainly understand the reservations about the, the shed because you know as soon as you see the word legalization in the proposal, uh, I know my heart skips a beat and my hands start to sweat. Um, but you know, I I, I I don't know how to address that. I, I'm e eager to hear how the other members of the board uh, feel about it. Uh, maybe we already know by now, but I, I think the uh, patio uh, is very lovely and um, I, I have no issues with that. Okay, thanks, Jim. Gerald? Um, I am enthusiastic about every aspect of this plan, except the shed. So I, not only would I have no trouble, I would be thrilled to approve all the plantings, uh, the, the patio, um, everything that's being proposed here. I have real concerns about the shed. 
Uh, and it's not just, as Jim says, that my heart, my heart doesn't skip a beat for legalization. Uh, sometimes people make honest mistakes, and I think this is an honest mistake. And my concern is there is right now from East Avenue, uh, a nondescript structure with a blank wall facing you in the front yard of a grand house. That's my concern, that all you know from East Avenue isn't the orientation of the shed to the house and how nice the shed looks on the other side. All you know from East Avenue is there's a big blank wall facing you that's blocking your view of the house. And I don't think we would have approved this initially. So my inclination would be to approve every aspect of this proposal, except the shed and put the shed on hold and invite the applicant to return to the board with a proposal that takes into account our concerns about the positioning of the shed and the face that the shed shows East Avenue and ask for proposals that might reorient the shed, that might move the shed, that might punch windows into the shed, that might develop plantings that shield the shed and let us reevaluate it. Because I would have trouble approving the shed as it stands at the moment. Thank you. Joe, a quick question, would you, would you, what are your thoughts on moving the shed somewhere? Thought about that? Um, the challenge is, I, I know the yard really well. This is not far from our house. This is a property we walk past frequently. Yeah. And there's no side yard, there's no backyard. Right. So I would probably favor turning it 90 degrees rather than moving it because I don't know where else to put it. So I would favor moving it 90 degrees, maybe adding a window on the side, I can't, on what would become the new East Avenue side, which is a smaller side, to give greater visual interest as you walk down Culver and some interest as you walk down East Avenue and twisting it on its side also means that you're putting the narrow side facing East Avenue rather than the wide side. So I don't know where I would move it to. And I don't object in principle to there being a shed on the property. I think they have a right to a shed and I think it's a well-designed shed though I do want detail on the windows, but I would probably move it 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. But I would invite them. I would say, these are our thoughts, move it 90 degrees, punch windows on the back, bring us multiple proposals because the current proposal I don't think is satisfactory. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kirsten, your thoughts, please. Um, agree with a lot of what's been said. I just feel like this entire property and the landscape proposal is so carefully conceived that again, this shed just feels there's no intentionality to its location. And um, Mary, right, Mary? Mary, <laughs> I feel like if you had this fresh, you could place this thing properly and I would leave it up to your discretion to say this is the right location and incorporate it into your landscape plan because there's so much being done here and not to consider this in the greater plan just seems like not only a missed opportunity but you know there's multiple problems with its current location and then the shed itself the shutters are bothering me I don't think they're properly sought these are the things that if they had come to us fresh I think the shutters are too small the uh Windows on the house are six over one, they're four over one on the shed. There's just a lot of little things that, again, if we had seen this from the onset, we would bring up. So at a minimum, I would say, I think it has to be incorporated into a larger landscape plan. Yeah, I think so too. Okay, anything else? Deborah, anybody else wanna come back after, no? Okay. Good point, Saul. I, I um, just, uh, you know, noting that, yeah, there is, a, this is one application, and if you prove in one part, I, I, I think there's got a sound idea about that. If you prove the, the blue stone patio and everything, you're precluding some options for the shed and you know vice versa um so that might be one thing to consider is whether you but if you're not going to prove the shed whether you want to withhold approving the the patio 
so that the uh, applicant has some more options about where to position things. Yeah, actually, as I listen to Tom and I think about what Kirsten said, um, that makes sense to me because what we're saying is the shed does not fit into the planting plan. Right. That we have incredibly well-developed planting plan for the yard and then the shed that suddenly we're all stuck with. And we can't talk, it, I think Kirsten's right and I think Tom is right. I think it's hard to talk about approving the planting plan and just say, and do something with the shed. I think it's all integrated. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Maybe, maybe we, maybe we could hold this case. Come back. How do you guys feel about that? I hate to do it because it's such a great plan, but <laughs> well, it'll. It's just with there. Mary, <laughs> with Mary's talent, she'll help us with this uh, yeah. with the shed. It's a great. It's a great plan that has a shed sitting in the front yard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it is December, right? Um, you're not going to plant anything, or probably do any hardscape, I wouldn't think. So we have, Mary's got a little time on her hands, I think. To... <laughs> I think Mary is interested in speaking. Tom, is that, would that be acceptable? Since we're in deliberations? You're muted. In this case, yes. Mary? Okay, I just, just a couple of things. I don't disagree with anything that you're saying. Um, I just want to um, stipulate that there's not a lot of wiggle room here and um, the, the ground goes up towards 1250. So moving the shed is not, it, it, it's not impossible, but it's going to be quite difficult. Um, as far as the other stuff goes, in, in, in my business, it's timing is very critical because we have these very small windows, especially in the spring. And we, the work needs to be set up and it, it needs to be planned and custom things need to be prepared and so on and so forth for this to go in. You know, the patio, for example, would be started weather permitting mid-March, just to give you an idea. That doesn't mean we don't have a little bit of time, but we don't have as much as you might think we have. For the fence, we would be, and that's on the other one that you've already approved, so that's not a problem. That would have been a massacre if that was delayed any further because it wouldn't be able to be produced in time. Um, so I, I'd like to tell you that we can do something with the shed that will make you happier, but I don't know if it will make you as happy as you want to be. So. For example, I need to know if what happens if it has to go on to 1240, for example. And I'm not saying that Mr. Norbert would want to do that or that that's what's going to happen, but there is a possibility of crossing that line. Um, if another, we just planted there, as you know, very close to where the shed is. So there isn't a lot of room unless you go on the, the, circul the vehicle circulation area. So while I think that you've made some good points, I just, I'm a little bit concerned about the feasibility of doing exactly what you're saying. I, I would suggest that if you stipulated a really nice planting on the back, I can promise you that I can do something very attractive on the back of that shed uh, could be, you know, four equally spaced plants or something that would reproduce a feeling of rhythm like you would experience. Okay, Mary, the like I, I think we've let you speak more than yeah. we probably sh like. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate point. it. I thank, so, thank you, Tom. And uh, so we'll let him yeah. go. Yeah. So, so I, I totally get what Mary's saying too. I respect it. I understand it. But if, if it becomes our problem, you know, it becomes our problem. If we had seen this before, we could have, you know, adjusted it. So. I'm sorry, but it's just not appropriate the way it is, um, in my opinion. Uh, I think that most of the board was was there as well. Um, how do you guys feel about this? Do you want to hold this and then have them come back with another design? Um, what are your thoughts, Deborah? I think it would be a good idea to hold it. Um, and that gives us a little bit more time and space and reflection to see what is possible. I think when it comes back to us, it would be great to, to have a couple of choices that Mary thinks are high quality and manageable. Um, but I, I think holding it is the most supportive way to proceed on what is an excellent 
proposal with with this one anomaly trying to integrate into it. I, I favor holding it. Okay, I do too. Um, I think it's the right thing to do. Kajano, what, what are your thoughts? Can't hear you. Kajano, what are your thoughts on holding it? Um, uh, I'm all for it. You, you broke up, yes. Okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, Jim Davini, how about you? Your final thoughts on this? No, I'm, I'm inclined toward holding it too. Uh, it's, it, since it was presented as a package, there's a part of the package that doesn't fit. And uh, so it's very hard to suddenly, you know, I, I hate it when we start breaking these things down and saying, well, we'll do this part, we won't do that part. It seems to me like it has to be a, a complete piece that we, uh, we finally decide on and we can't do that right now. Gotcha. And Gerald? Um, so I would hold it and I will speak for myself. I obviously can't speak for all of you unless it becomes a motion. Um, I want to specify my concerns with the shed. Number one are materials. Uh, we still need to know what the windows are, what the shutters are made out of. And as Kirsten points out, uh, each shutter should be exactly half the width of the window. There's a proper width for a shutter. So we need to know that the shutter dimensions, the shutter materials, the window materials. My greatest concern about the shed is its orientation to East Avenue. What you see when you look at it from East Avenue that you see a long blank wall. And so my, my bias going in, if we were just looking at drawings rather than a building that's already there, would be for the shed to pivot 90 degrees and to make sure that you have a smaller side facing East Avenue and do something visually interesting with the building on that side. So I just wanted to be clear what I would hope we start seeing. And then we see a planting plan that incorporates the shed fully rather than just has the shed stuck there. So that's my long way of saying I would vote to put it on hold. Thank you. And David Matthews? Uh, yeah, I agree. Um, you know, Mary got some, a little bit of work, but she's uh, talented and I'm sure she can come up with some options that, uh, you know, we can at least consider. Okay, and Kirsten? Sorry to kind of beat this to death, but I want to hear everyone's yep. final. No, I agree. It's a package deal and um, I'd leave it up to the design professional to come up with the right solution. And maybe it doesn't move at all, but they have to convince us, you know? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Dave Matthews, would you want to tackle this motion? Second here. All right, for case number seven, file A-021-20-21 for a certificate of appropriateness to legalize the installation of a 10 foot by 16 foot accessory shed at the rear yard of the single family dwelling and to remove existing patio and landscape area for the rear yard and install a new 570 square foot bluestone patio which will include a fountain and landscape area. I propose that we hold this case until next month. Second. Okay, motion has been made by David Matthews and properly seconded by Gerald Gam. I'll call out the vote. We will start with Deborah Beardsley. Deborah, you yay or nay on this motion? I vote yay on... Um on the motion to postpone. Great, thank you. Next would be me, Christopher Coretta. I vote yay for the motion. Kajana Crawford? Yay for the motion. Kajana Crawford votes yay for the motion. Jim Devinney? The motion. Jim Devinney votes yay for the motion. Gerald Gam? I vote yay. Gerald Gam votes yay for the motion. David Matthews? I vote yay. David Matthews votes yay for the motion. And Kirsten Solberg? Yay. Kirsten Solberg votes yay for the motion. It's unanimous. Uh, thank you very much for your time, Mary. We look forward to seeing you again. And that will close the case. Thank you all. Um, can I ask one quick question? Because I, we're done, but actually it occurs to me there might be one technical problem that I want Tom and Chris to speak to. The motion, if I'm remembering it, is for the case to come back to us in January. Is there time for that to happen? I guess that's uh, a Chris question. 
So I, the deadline is. Go ahead, Tom. What were we gonna say? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm watching Chris in action, and though their deadlines for publishing, um, Mary would have to like do her work in about a week or less. You know, you better so, get out of this hearing right now and start yeah. working on it, Mary. So I was having trouble, and it was troubled by that too. That maybe it should just be held. I mean, the. the the applicant's motivated to move as quick yeah. as they can. I mean, you could say, you know, as long as they're back by Feb February, but you could also say just as long as they return because it remains unapproved in a violation. Is there a way for us to amend the motion and remove the month? Y yeah. Yeah, you can do that. I would recommend doing that actually. Yeah. Sorry, I missed the January part. Yeah, it yeah just it's a good point to that you raised that. <laughs> So Dave, would, should we extend it to should we extend it to February? I would extend it to March. I mean, they're motivated to come back as soon as possible. It's not well. That's just Mary. That's just the deadline. I mean, you can come back in January I if you want. I understand. I understand. But there's after this, there's another step in the process, and there's a waiting period, and there's so so. I'm just trying to think ahead. Um, you want to keep it in January? The way it is. No, if I can't if I can't get it to you, but if it's in February then I, there has to be a permit issued after that. And that could be a lapse of several weeks and so on and so forth. So that's my only concern. Um, Mary, we're not precluding you from doing it in January. We're just trying to give a little bit more flexibility. Yeah, I understand. What's, when would it have to be submitted in order to be, I mean, I wouldn't have to resubmit all the, the patio stuff, right? Just put well, it well, in. The whole the idea of the thing is that you could, we want, the board wants you to consider a, a integrated design that addresses their concerns. And so it doesn't just mean coming back with the exact same patio. If you could come up with a placement system that addresses their concerns about the shed. You see, I so mean, like you, you, you put the ruled shed out a certain area to accommodate the footprint yeah. of your patio that you you could move elsewhere to accommodate the shed. To answer right. your que question, Mary, about timing, an application would have to be submitted a month prior to the hearing for that month. So, and it would be an, an extension to February application deadline or hearing. Is that what people would be thinking about, board members? And I'm using February as an example. I understand. Would, would be the hearing, correct? You're talking right. about. So it'd be a month prior to. So whatever the board members are interested in doing and amending that. So I was just going to propose that we amend it to February or March, and then Mary can work with Chris and figure out yeah. okay. what works for her to come back. Like, I'm, I, I will just speak for me. I'm indifferent as to whether we see this case in January or February or March. I would leave it up to Mary to work with Chris on what's yeah. going to work best. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I agree. So Dave Matthews, do you want to uh, hit us again with that motion, please? Do you want me to amend it? Mm, you're breaking your start over. You're breaking up. I'm sorry. I couldn't hear what you said. I think he's asking whether we want him to amend it or to offer a fresh proposal. I think we should just offer a fresh proposal. <clears throat> do you want me to amend it or start over? Just let's do a fresh proposal if you don't mind. All right. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, for case number seven, file A-021-20-21 for a certificate of appropriateness at 324 Culver Road to legalize the installation of a 10 foot by 16 foot accessory shed structure at the rear yard of this single family dwelling and to remove an existing patio and landscape area in the rear yard and install a new 570 square foot bluestone patio, which will include a fountain and landscape area. I propose that we hold this case and 
let the applicant come back within a three month time period to represent the case. Second. Okay, a motion has been made by David Matthews, properly seconded by Gerald Gam. We will go down this road again and I will call out the vote. And we will start with Deborah Beardsley. Deborah, do you vote yay or nay for the motion? I vote yay for the motion. Thank you. I, Christopher Coretta, vote yay for the motion. Tijana Crawford. I vote yay for the motion. Tijana Crawford votes yay for the motion. Jim Devinney. I vote yay for the motion. Jim Devinney votes yay for the motion. Gerald Gam. I vote yay. Gerald Gam votes yay for the motion. David Matthews. I vote yay. David Matthews votes yay for the motion. And Kirsten Solberg. Yay. Kirsten Solberg, yay for the motion. That is unanimous. Okay. That would close that case. Thank you. That was the last case for tonight's hearing. Um, we thank all applicants and citizens and thank you board members. You got us through this uh, very quickly tonight, um, as always. Um, the next scheduled hearing will be held on January 6th, 2020. This hearing is scheduled to be a virtual meeting and will be streamed live to the mayor's office's YouTube page. Any changes to this process will be posted on the city's website. Any comments or questions regarding this hearing or the Rochester Preservation Board can be sent to staff at preservationboard at cityofrochester.gov. And that is it, everyone. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.